Hi everyone. Can you hear me okay? Now, <laughs> we have got over a thousand people and our cat only goes to a thousand people. So far out. I, <laughs> I expected about a couple of hundred. So um, not quite sure what to say here. So obviously the topic is hot. So we're going to be live streaming it. So I'm just giving it a couple of minutes because Grace, what we're doing is live streaming it through to our The Awakening Within page. And then what we're doing is we're sending it through and we're sharing it um, into various groups like the Perth Awake Business, um, onto my personal page. Um, yeah, and just basically, you know, our various groups, like that. that's all we can do because, yeah, like, I'm, we had 3,200 or some ridiculous number register. <laughs> and I don't think I've ever had more than 300 register for a webinar before. So you have to excuse the fact that I would say that this is a fairly hot topic, to put it mildly. So, yeah, well, it's interesting because I was actually saying, like, I've done webinars for business for years as well as doing my spiritual one. And it's just, it's just been a bit of a learning for me too. I'll share this to start with because I... I did this webinar literally purely to give back. I just was meeting so many people having challenges. So I just thought I'd do it. And I really, that's, that was all I was interested in. So it's funny how things work, isn't it? Anyway, um, just checking with my team how the live stream is going so I can get underway. Because, um, yeah, we've already blown our account. So maybe just message me on the, on the Skype chat and let me know. So if maybe my team could just let me know what's going on with this and making sure. So as soon as you guys know anyway, Grace, just feel free to take the mic and, um, you know, just butt in on me and let me know where it's live streamed exactly. So I feel free to butt in any time. I'll get sure. started. Hi, Grace. Hi. Hi, Warren. Just letting you know it's on the Awakening Within page and now I'm about to send the copy to Perth Awakening Business. To Perth Awake Business, great. Could you also share it to the... Awakening Within Transformational Group and to my personal page as well. Sure, okay. Great, thank you. Bye everyone. Okay, so anyway, there you go. Um, okay, so... I'll put and, my and, and Warren, just to... Sorry to interrupt you there. We are just getting a number of questions about is it going to be recorded? Uh, can I share it with other people and things like that? Okay, that will all be covered shortly in housekeeping, Steve. Okay, great. Great. Okay, so... Okay, so this is to be very clear. Now, one of the things that I'm going to give some rules in this webinar because we've got so many people and just um, basically a lot of people message me asking for advice and questions. And despite the fact that I've clearly said I'm not a lawyer, I'm happy to educate. I will do 100 webinars. I was going to say a week, that's exaggerating, but I do plenty. What I've been doing now is people who don't listen to that and you, and you, and you keep messaging for advice, I just basically make sure your messages go to spam. So that's just being very blunt. Um, if you're going to private message me, make sure it's either one, a greeting to say hi and thank you and just want to get to know me. I always like saying hi to someone. I'll pretty much respond to you. Or number two, you like in a genuine situation, you really need a referral. Sometimes I can respond, but I do get inundated at the moment. So that's just to let everyone know. Um, but I'm not actually a registered lawyer. I haven't been for six years. I was at one stage for many many years and did a lot of stuff so i'll happily be sharing a little bit more about that story but basically this is about self-empowerment i'm really desiring to help you to empower yourself so you don't have to keep looking outside yourself to lawyers other people or whoever else to save you from the nasty evil government it's really teaching everyone to act, to find your own power without spending a fortune so don't take anything as legal advice, nor does it take into account your personal situation. And if you really still don't feel sufficiently empowered, seek professional advice. There's great lawyers like Nathan Buckley from GNB Lawyers, who's just, I've spoken to a marvellous guy. No doubt there's others around about everywhere. So, you know, there's some amazing people around who are doing some amazing stuff to help the world right now and help this country. And who in all honesty are probably smarter than me than when it comes to the law. My, my strength is more that I'm street smart. You know, I learned... I was always clever in finding ways around the system. When I was in school, 
I, I worked out how to get around a system where I did virtually no study and still got high marks, but just by doing these techniques. So I've always been good at finding ways around being street smart and that kind of stuff. But it doesn't mean I'm the smartest lawyer you'll ever meet in your life. And half the questions that you will ask on the Biosecurity Act, in all honesty, I'll probably have no idea. But <laughs> that's really, really frank with you. You know, I'm not, I'm not a guru who knows everything with this. I really don't. I just, I've just had a lot of experience from my time in underground movements, from um, being a lawyer, from standing up for myself, from taking on insane cases in court and to my complete shock more than anything else, winning them, just doing them for a bit of a laugh or just for, because I was very angry about what I was seeing happening. So anyway, hopefully the wisdom will benefit you today. So, okay, we're going to do some housekeeping um, to deal with this. So just keep get rid of distractions um, if you can, that'd be really good. Um, then the second one is how long it will go for. I was, I've said 90 minutes, but look, there's so many people here and I think there's going to be so many questions. My plan in an ideal world is to go for 90 minutes, take questions and answers and then finish. That's my plan. But like I said, if you're really like keen for knowledge and I see people are hungry and desiring, look, it doesn't worry me if I go longer than that. It really doesn't bother me. Um, I actually enjoy it. Now, with the chat, yep, look, type your questions, but I'm sure you can appreciate when we've got a lot of a thousand people, it's just going to be impossible to, um, what I'm going to do is I've got Steve and Grace, who you've heard their voices jump on here. They will monitor the chat, and I've asked them just that when at question time, they will be seeing the questions, and then they will be feeding them through to me if they feel that, you know, try as much as possible to get questions where, let's say, eight people are asking the same question, but yeah, look, they'll, they'll raise it with me. I'll get Steve to do that with me. Um, the other thing there's rules. Um, some people are kind and give warnings. I don't, I have a simple rule. If someone is insulting, toxic or gives shit or um, whatever else, I've just told the moderators, kick them straight off the webinar so someone else can get on. So I've just said, don't give any warnings. So I'm pretty strict, pretty tough when it comes to that kind of stuff. Um, I'll be giving a lot, respecting a lot back, but yeah, like I said, just make sure that you, um, you know, um, respect the rules, respect all that kind of stuff. Um, taking handwritten notes for better retention, and the recording will be available on YouTube, but with, with a big catch. And the big catch is that I'm not actually going to be recording all of it. I'll be recording some of it, but some of my stuff, like, Going into the deeper stuff around the mask, the jabs, a few of that kind of stuff. I've made a decision I'll shut the recording off and I'll tell my team. Most of this will be recorded, but some of the stuff where I'm actually getting into, you know, really educating on some specifics, I'm just choosing not to do that. So, um, okay. So it's good that you're here live because, like I said, you're going to get the benefits of um, the, best, the best stuff. So what will we be covering today? Okay. We'll be covering today um, why civilizations collapse, um, government mandates and how they work, state of emergency, what it really is. And keep in mind, in a couple of hours, 90 minutes to two hours, it's pretty damn hard to cover everything. So no doubt you'll walk away thinking about 90% of your stuff wasn't covered. But like I said, that's really all you can actually do. I can only work within that. So state of emergency, what it actually really is, in simple terms, um, masks, jabs, invade. This is the part I won't be recording. Masks, jabs, invasive tests, how to deal with them, know your rights and position. That's the part I will be shutting off the recording. And then I'll be re resuming it at point five. How to handle yourself when confronted by the police or placed under arrest. Um, this is extremely important because it's I hate to tell you this, but you probably already worked it out. I think we're going to be seeing a lot more arrests, a lot more things where people having confrontations of authorities, militaries turning up and stuff that you probably never imagined you see in your lifetime, but unfortunately it appears that you probably will. So um, then so that's very important. This is from my experience as a lawyer, having my sister, who's one of the best criminal lawyers in this state, without exaggerating, she's spectacular. Um, she's helped many clients. She's helped me out a couple of times. I've been very successful representing people when I used to be a lawyer and, this, and anything to do with um, with authorities and very successful in my own right. I've been tax audited twice. I have gone through legal practice regulatory board, you know, inquiry for three effing years, excuse the French, came out of it unscathed. A couple of ASIC investigations and 
various other shit, and I've come out of every one of them completely, by and large, unscathed. So I can give you a lot of street smart wisdom in this area that will really help you. So um, in terms of the live stream, just a reminder for the new ones who are there, um, it's been put to um, our awake, it's a Facebook page called The Awakening Within. And I've asked Grace to share it to, um, you know, to the Awakening Within groups, um, to Perth Awake Business, and also to mine as well. So um, Grace, you could also share it to my personal Warren Black page as well. That would be really great, um, you know, and let me know once you've done it. Okay. Um, I'll let the team put it in the chat, the exact name. Um, so practical survival tips to remain safe. This is really important. I hate to tell you, but when the apocalyptic shit is hitting the fan, you really do want to go a little bit extreme worst case scenario. And in the best case scenario, half the stuff I'm saying today won't actually happen. Seven is where this is all heading as I see it. And unfortunately I've been overall pretty accurate, not because I'm a genius, but just because I can logically map out conclusions and I've been pretty accurate so far. And finally, and this is my big passion beyond all else, why I cannot see anything changing without a real spiritual or um, consciousness awakening. And you've in every single society which has seen this shit happen, that's the only thing that stopped the rot. That's the only thing has been an actual spiritual awakening and reformation. I can tell you, and, I, and I'm passionate because from my personal experience, it completely changed my life. Like I went from a bullied guy who in school, who was a bit of a coward, who was anything but an alpha male, you know, I, what I call a fake alpha male, looked like I was one, but I was a coward. I was bullied at school. I had no idea how to stand up for myself. I was, I, my boundaries were fucked, excuse the French. People were not good at being able to, I couldn't do it. And it was my own spiritual awakening and inner transformation that completely changed my life and gave me the power to do the work which I'm doing. Someone's saying language, please, um, Grace, just remove such people from the webinar. I really don't wish for people to be um, correcting my language. Okay, just remove him instantly. No, um, no leniency. Okay, and like you said, I'm just being me. I'm One of the things I've learned in life as part of my own awakening is just to be truthful to myself. I'm, I'm giving, I'm kind, I can get easily irritable, I can overreact, and then later on I think, okay, I've probably reacted a bit extreme. And that's just me being me. And hopefully out of this webinar, many others will become you and learn just to be you. Because you're going to need to be you. You're going to need to be empowered and you're going to need to be strong to move through this situation and what is to come because we are in a spiritual war. Okay, so... Like I said, that's just my own ground rule. I told the team, if anyone does that, corrects my language or tells me what to do, you'll be instantly removed from the webinar. No warnings whatsoever. I have no time for it whatsoever. It's the reason our society's in a mess because you've got too many pretty little effing princesses, excuse the French. Okay, so let's, for those who are ready for war and to be strong, let's do something about this, shall we? So, like I said, there will be no offer or selling. And I've done it deliberately. That's, I really don't want to do that. I, one of my passions was to give back. I've been blessed the last number of months. So I've had a really blessed year in business, in life. Things have been coming together for me. I'm keen to give back and give back as much as I can. And you find that as life goes on, and all of you will find that, you start to desire to leave a legacy. You desire to want to change the lives and help other people. And as I see it, if I can, while I'm on this planet, make a real difference and help my state and help my country as best as I can, then fabulous. That's, that's how I see this, because at the end of the day, we all benefit from it. And you'll all find the same thing. There's a great joy in giving and a great joy in serving. Um, although there'll be no offer, we do do further free webinars on rights, on empowering yourself, on spiritual laws for free, um, which I'll be just mentioning at the end and showing you where you can come if you would like to be part of those groups, you know? And others are saying, thank you for being real and raw. Well, look, thank you, yes. That's the best way I can serve and how we all can serve, just speaking our truth and being our raw, authentic, inhuman self. And I believe why people love Donald Trump was Trump really is a bit of a dick, but I love Trump because Trump's raw. Trump is, Trump is what you see as a man. You see the great leader, you see the irritable, um, kind of very self-absorbed narcissist of a man as well. But you see Trump the man, and that's what I love about Trump. That's why I love him. And I think deep down, people love someone who's raw and who's real. 
So my background, just so you know about who I am, for those of you who haven't come across me before, yeah, look, I'm a qualified accountant, lawyer, and planner with over 30 years experience. Um, yeah, you can guess my age probably. Um, 10 years experience with the tax office. I was an auditor um, at one stage and various other things. And then I found salvation and glory to God came out to help people with a light. <laughs> that was just my little joke. Um, 20 years experience in practice, just doing various companies. I've been running WealthSafer Financial One, Offshore, um, tax specialist, entrepreneur. I mean, all weird labels, but this really means I've helped people around money, finances, business, that kind of stuff. So that's the main thing which I've been doing. I've been involved in underground movements over the years as well, like off the grid. That's been one of my things, um, you know, um, things like that. And been involved in helping people with international tax planning, investing, education, still do all that to this day. So really, I'm a bit of a split personality. There's the financial guy, which you see on the right. But then the left, you see the yogi and in me. And since I was a boy, very young, the spiritual has I've hungered for that. And like I said, that has been my secret for my own awakening and my own transformation to take me from a very um, cowardly guy with a very, very low opinion of myself who probably got rejected with just about any girl in my teens and 20s I even tried because my, my, my self-belief was so bad. Um, to actually finding a lot of power and finding quality of life. So that's the thing. That's why I'm so passionate about both sides to bring that balance. So this probably summarizes me and probably many of you others. Um, one of my favorite quotes. Um, you're entirely bonkers, but I'll tell you a secret, all the best are. And yeah, I'm an absolute nut. That's what I tell people. I'm sure many of you are. Anyone here relate to this? You, you, know, you know you're an absolute fruitcake, tinfoil hat, whatever you want to call. Um, yeah, I mean, that's me, you know. I should be wearing my tinfoil hat right now, well and truly. Yeah, it's great to be a nut. Who wants to be normal in this normal world? Uh, okay. So firstly, why civilizations collapse? And this is really important because really what we're seeing we get so afraid because we don't know history and by and large unfortunately as i learned in the history in the underground movement history has been significantly altered and suppressed and i've seen deleted history books and i've compared them to current ones and been in absolute shock and unfortunately for me or fortunately i first awakened to everything like 20 odd years ago so you can imagine me living in the world knowing what was coming and seeing all this stuff happening and trying to awaken people and looking at me like I was a complete fruitcake. And that was because I learned about civilization collapses. I learned how that happened. And everything that was happening in Australia and America, I thought, we absolutely hit that to the T. We are absolutely gonna collapse. You know, we are gonna completely fall apart as a civilization. And so far we have followed the blueprint of Rees, Moggs and Davidson's 1995 Sovereign Individual book to the letter. You know, we're going right through a major civilization collapse. And I don't know what you'll know, but America, I've been predicting for years, will move into hyperinflation as socialism takes off. And I'll tell more about that, but America's going nuts with its prices. We are moving into a major meltdown. We really are. And the issue is when you have a society who we're living by the effects of the mass common denominator principle, which means this is why we see this stuff going on, because if you've got 40% of the people awake, which sounds high, but if 60% can, can, can take control of the voting, they will decide who gets into the government. That's kind of what we're dealing with right now. Um, so yeah, there's actually, um, people are asking a lot about the live streams. So just so you know, yeah, they're on the, I'll just, I will keep mentioning that because I appreciate that people are joining and asking. So the Awakening Within Facebook page, and then it's also being shared to um, the Perth Awake Business and the Awakening of In Transformation Group. So, like I well, said, I'm just, well, yes, I'm just letting you know. Just letting you know, I can't share it on your personal one because you don't. I don't have access to post on your um, timeline. Oh, that's fine. I'll see if I can get into there and and um, approve it. I don't know how to do that. Oh well, um, no matter. Okay, so. Anyway, um, what I might even do then is just, yes, yeah, so you've got the mass common denominator principle. So the Roman Empire, 
It's really important to understand how the Roman Empire actually did collapse because the Roman Empire is probably it's a fitting book. And when you actually study the detailed collapse of the Roman Empire on spiritual, physical, emotional, every kind of thing, and then you compare it to what is happening today, it is really quite extraordinary. Like it really is when you go, whoa, you know, you will actually watch an amazement as you will see similarities and the book gives a series of steps and because like i said I'm, tr I'm attempting to cover as many things as i can right now in simple terms everything we're seeing from cracking down with laws corruption with the governments more and more government officials coming on living by absolute greed you know government officials just absolutely doing what they want um you know so absolutely yeah doing what they want um it's just, yeah, you know, crazy, crazy stuff. So, yeah, so basically the Roman Empire fell because ultimately governments became so corrupt, like so completely and utterly corrupt that eventually the whole thing just melted down. And then what happened was in simple terms, like it got so bad, like debauchery was rife. Like the, the government were just living it up. The soldiers were getting large money and the governments, it sounds similar today, living off the people's um, money. The wealthy were paying higher and higher taxes. The um, soldiers were actually spending more time in orgies and drunkenness than they actually were in, in preparing to fight. They then started to run out of money to try and meet this huge beast that they were trying to feed. They frantically tried to um you know they then to, to get more money so then they increased taxes and then the wealthy started moving their money out of rome into the foreign countries the government then increased taxes more they did it then they started stopping uh limiting moving money out of rome then they eventually banned money being moved out of rome and eventually they locked the city of rome down and let no one out so if that sounds familiar today that's kind of what we're in now in 2019 i said people around me i know but i know but we know and robert kiyosaki porter stangery and many economists have been talking about this coming meltdown i said this meltdown will be severe i just cannot see how we're gonna what's gonna precipitate it and i think the governments are already doing that now because they can see what is actually coming so this is the problem is when you've had years of freedoms like we had where you know, I would never say we've been the freest time in history because we haven't, but we've certainly been one of the freer groups in the Western world. We can travel with the planes, we can go to places, we by and large haven't had invasion wars coming into our country and like Lebanon or Iraq and knowing bombs hitting us. By and large, we've lived in the West very protected, very protected. We have had opportunities for prosperity like are uh, almost unfathomed and unprecedented. You know, we've been so, we've been so blessed and that historically in Rome, in everywhere else, it breeds mental laziness. And it doesn't surprise me, but if you actually look at the statistics on the jab, guess who's absolutely running for it right now? It's the millennials, it's those who are under 30, absolutely running. They're fighting over it, they're getting mad, but they can't get it. That's what's actually happening right now. Um, I have many of these ones are just openly saying, look, I don't want it, but I'll get it because I want to travel. And I, I remember saying that nine months, a year ago to my son, early on in the process, I said, oh, don't worry, they'll get 70% to take it. And they said, why? I said, well, I said, 40% will be running for it. 30% will take it so they can travel, they can go to the brothel, they can visit their favorite stripper, they can get drunk at the pub without wearing a mask. Um, they can, yeah, it, I said, that's just what's gonna happen. It sounds horrible, but it's the unfortunate truth. So that's what, um, Yes, yeah, so that's what's going on right now. So unfortunately, and I don't judge people for that, to be clear, but this is just, just factual what's happening. You know, this is the reality of what is going on, that people don't like, to, it all comes down to the fear of death. People don't like to lose what they have. The, the great master Buddha once said, suffering only occurs because of attachment. When we release all attachment, suffering ends. And I think he nailed it. Like when you are attached to your life, to your cars, to your travel. Um, the thing that made this whole situation easy for me was I let go, as soon as I saw what happened in March last year, I just let go of everything. I just said that nah, we're not traveling for years, so that's fine. 
I just made that decision. I knew we wouldn't be. Didn't bother me. Never upset me. I just thought, okay, so what's the next stage? Okay, got to start getting ready for an apocalypse. That's life. Okay, let's do it. So I just got busy preparing in the background, doing some of the stuff I'll be sharing with you today um, and said, okay, let's just get ready for it. Um, so be it. Um, and that's just the way things are. No point grieving over what's been. Let's just move forward into the world that actually is now. And that's why by and large, it's been a relatively smooth time because I just quickly let go of what's going on. And that's probably one thing I'll be showing you later on. It's the only way to get through this right now. You just let go and just accept that what the world as you know it is dead, it's gone, um, it's out. So it's preparing for a new world ahead and deciding how it's gonna be shaped. So mental laziness from prosperity, that's what we're dealing with right now. And unfortunately that's vicious. That's, I'm more scared of the citizens laziness than I am of the government. Government doesn't bother me. By and large, we're just doing what the people are wanting from them. As, as, as crazy as that sounds, they're doing what by and large ma ma the majority wants. Okay. Unfortunately, I've gone through, I've found every statistical poll I can find, non-manipulated polls, and every single one of them tell me that between 55 to 60% of people are supporting what's going on. Um, that's crazy as it actually sounds. So that's life. So socialism, unfortunately, has been used many, 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 many times, and 100% of the time it ends up with the same result. And for those of you who don't know what socialism is, it really just means giving, printing money out of nothing and giving it away to people. So America have gone completely and utterly bonkers. I don't know who's been following America. I'm talking to friends. It's gone up 25 cent prices have probably gone up in the last six to nine months. People are in shock over there. Friends of mine want to get out. Fuel, food, everything. That's what happens in socialism. Venezuela collapsed for that reason. Zimbabwe collapsed for that reason in the 80s. Germany, 1923. You can't print money out of nothing without the wealthy pulling their money out quick smart and eventually people lose trust in the currency. US is about between one to three years away from an absolutely monstrous collapse. Will that affect Australia and everywhere else? Oh, yes. And so and now the only thing that cushioned Australia a bit is, as strange as it sounds, regard, despite his appalling regard to human rights, one thing Morrison has done well is manage the economic situation and refuse to get too caught up in the socialism mentality. And that, by and large, has kept Australia financially intact. So provided he wins the next election, I anticipate Australia, although it will hurt badly from this, from this meltdown, we potentially could be a little bit better off. And whereas the US will, will completely break down bar a miracle. That's where I see that happening. But socialism historically has done that. Um, historically has done that. So socialism. So basically printing money, giving it away for programs and millennials love it. Younger people are craving for it. They're screaming for it because by and large, let's go back a slide. This is what people want. People desire the same lifestyle and do as little as possible. Laptop millionaire, sit there and trade, do what they want. And that's what happens, unfortunately, when the elite are doing exactly that. And they are, the elite are doing that. So the people do that. And then the people do it, so the elite do it. It's just a horrible vortex and spiral. And that is why getting back to old fashioned service and giving is one of the only ways through this. Hence why I'm doing what I'm doing today. Hence why getting back to old fashioned work even if you're financially wealthy today, you know, and you don't have to work, work, work in some way, give back, serve, go and work in a, in a, in a homeless shelter, you know, or go and work as a fruit picker. It doesn't matter. Work and productive um, enterprise is what's going to help help. So we're at a huge war right now. We really are. And the biggest war that I would say right now is in our consciousness. You know, it's the biggest war and it's, this is the biggest thing we've got to protect above all else is our consciousness and our, our frequency and our mind and being able to stand our ground and be able to, yeah, stay calm. Right now we're in a siege. And as I was explaining to someone the other day, I said, if you go back to old fashioned um, warfare, I'm sure many of you have seen Lord of the Rings. And in that second movie, in that third, you may remember what they did was they besieged the city. They surrounded it with their armies. And the reason they siege a city is that eventually people run out of food and water and they have to surrender or they're forced out to fight and then they can kill them. So right now, the, the West is under siege from a foreign force. That's what's happening, as I said. Um, 
and attempting to break people's spirits. And I hate to say, but right now it's working. Um, the majority of people are dispirited, they're tired. My observation in Perth with our most recent lockdown, I think there was a, actually a greater amount of people wearing masks and complying than there was last time. And friends of mine in business have all observed the same thing. So um, stuff like that. So we're at war with the West and with its freedoms. So there's nothing new under the sun, as the great King Solomon once said. So what has been done, been is what will, I will be, and what has been done is what will be done, and there's nothing new under the sun. Is there a thing in which it is said, see, this is new, it has been already. So there's nothing new. This is an ancient method of conquest, what's going on right now. Siege a city, or siege a civilization, um, cut, cut off their supply to prosperity, to their water sources, to whatever else, get them dependent upon them, and then eventually people will break and they will obey. And it's very successful and it works extremely well. So rest assured that what's being done is extremely effective and bar a really great awakening, it will, in my opinion, it will probably work. I think they will probably end up getting what they're looking for. And I know that's not what people want to hear, but, but without some kind of awakening, um, this, this webinar today and seeing so many people, I have to say, was such a shock for me and such, a, in a way, a pleasant surprise because it does actually show, I think, that people are a little bit like, we've got to do something and we've got to do it fast. So um, there's many examples I can give you and the result has always been the same. I personally, US civilization as we know it will end. I see it now. Um, that's virtually inevitable. Um, it'll come back, no doubt, but for now, it's going to be going through a brutal time and that will affect the rest of the Western world. So examples, Babylon, Persia, Greece, all of these were great empires. They thought they would never crash, but they did. Same story, got rich, got greedy, got lazy. Their military stopped doing much other than having orgies and, and having um, drunkenness. And that's the truth. They were, if you, you can look it up yourself. They got into more and more oppression. They got into more and more brutality, removing human rights, doing horrible stuff to people. Um, people just complied, just complied, complied. Eventually they had enough. People stopped complying. Um, things just broke down and then eventually they were invaded and a new force took over. And the first thing they always went for was the educated people. So again, it's really no different. Middle Ages, same thing. Um, they collapsed. 1930s, Great Depression happened for that exact reason. 1920s was a booming period. They, I can't remember the name, but it was a roar, no, the Roaring Twenties. It was known for its extraordinary prosperity. People believed it would never collapse, that the stock market would never go down again like it did previously. People were leveraging, borrowing, mar margining, but they crashed and they crashed badly and three years later were in a Great Depression and they had a great reset. And yes, they did. 1933, they had a great reset. Resets happen like over and over and over throughout history. So this great reset that you're hearing about over and over again, nothing new under the sun, plenty of resets. So are we heading for another one? No doubt. No doubt we're heading for another reset. No doubt we're heading for a new financial system. No doubt the majority of people will lose all their money or most of it. Argentina, Venezuela, um, Cyprus, I could just go on and on and on. Um, it's this whole thing of something for nothing that unfortunately has come in and by and large people have given up their power and become mentally lazy. Meanwhile, this government foreign force, whoever's taking the takeover, you cannot deny the planning of these people. Somehow, with some genius planning, in March 2020, last year, just about every single thing um, that was going on, like every single thing that was happening um, at the time, was, um, you know what, I've had a mental blank. <laughs> there you go. I can't remember what I was even saying. Um, so, yeah, sorry, yeah, I remember now. They were planning for decades. So 2020... You can see that. I mean, how could you possibly have every single thing in March 2020 country in the, in the world shut down at the same time, pretty much? So you can see that. Um, I have noticed in comments and chat about Soviet and various other people and things like that. Um, you know, but it's true. I mean, I, I'm finding the people most awakened, the people who were in communist um, Russia in the 1980s in East Germany, people in Lebanon and Beirut and places like that. 
it, what's unfortunately anyone under 40 doesn't really have much idea about what the world has been like in the past or at least under 35 and that's a large percentage of our society so that's one of the reasons as well they're just not aware of how bad these places were whereas most of these places in the world are very very aware of it now and the older people are much more aware about these things and people from these countries know what these things mean and know how badly one of my close friends who comes from lebanon she just said her parents last year in march just started to, they virtually were sobbing they're saying we are so far f excuse the word they were just saying that we really are they said we know what this means we know who this is going so you know it's unfortunately that's the reality that we're dealing with so life purpose like i said versus the watery um that's what actually happens so if you don't have a purpose or mission you fall into the bought tree and that's what's happened in our civilization we've got caught up with greed prosperity most people prefer to, to, to build wealth for themselves their spiritual foundation is almost non-existent anymore there's like a belief that god is that we're just pretty much all our own gods and can do whatever we want every society that does that always eventually collapses and stops giving a purpose beyond themselves and they move into debauchery like excess food there was a civilization called Sodom and Gomorrah that was, you may have heard of it from a biblical sense, but they were very prosperous civilizations. And when you actually read about them, they were, their prosperity was insane, but they just started doing what they wanted. They started being horrendous in their court system. Their legal system became like, like our current one. Their financial system became completely corrupt and favored people. And eventually the, the civilization was destroyed. The debauchery or, you know, immorality, um, things like that absolutely you know was yeah was basically um rife so okay so that's the civilization collapses so unfortunately right now we are in a civilization collapse now that's not all doom and gloom because what the sovereign individual did predict which i do believe as well that we will see what comes out of this in time a breakdown of a new world order and we'll see much more smaller sovereign communities form throughout the world you will hear of places like West Australia will probably succeed from the rest of the Commonwealth. Um, North Queensland will probably succeed from the rest of Queensland. Even in West Australia, probably some parts will succeed from other parts. I think you'll just see that more and more happen. Um, so there is, a, there is a, a light at the end of the tunnel to all of this. So, um, but yes, that's what generally happens. So a civilization collapse, we are in the middle of it. But if you're not prepared and not like navigating your way through it, you will be absolutely burnt from this whole thing. So let's have a look now at number two, how the legal system works. Let's see how I'm going for time. Yeah, well, um, um, yep, still going. <laughs> okay, so here we are. Okay, so legal system, let's have a look. Um, common law and look again there's going to be some of you who know all this stuff and know better and like i said i'm just aiming to give an overview give the best help i can and just yeah cover my simple street smart understanding and like i said i, I one thing i can tell you all is i've lived this in my own life i if you even for example go onto the internet um and just actually have a look and um i'll even show you for example um so when you go and google you'll see like there i was in the panama papers i was named in the media then um this was one of my favorite ones i took on a speeding fine case in queensland and i had i just didn't think i'd win it was just more because i just wanted to prove a point because i was really annoyed and because i was afraid of doing it i don't like letting fear rule me i went and argued that the queensland court had no jurisdiction over me as a west australian but i went it was deeper than that that wasn't the main argument and to my complete and out of astonishment i won this case so i've done stuff like this i've won various cases so you know it's not theoretical for me i haven't just sat there on the internet in fact i learned most of my stuff in a private underground movement off the grid without before i even learned anything from the internet and quite the contrary i was taught by the um ex-cia assassins and you know world secret agents that i was you know part of that network they said you can pretty much assume that most of the internet is crap and it's deliberate disinformation to confuse people so i'm very wary i don't when people send me videos i rarely watch them unless they come from reputable sources i don't watch them you know i don't read my stuff on the internet when it comes to this because i know most of it just isn't true um the protected common law rights and acts such as magna carta bill of rights um 
again, if you actually read the true history books and not the deleted history books, for example, or sorry, the, 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 not the ones you see now, the Magna Carta wasn't quite what's taught even in today's common law movement. It's quite an extraordinary story behind it of how this came about and how the Renaissance came in from an extraordinary revolution that happened in England. But the revolution that happened actually involved a change in the consciousness of the people and then involved a change in the consciousness of the king. And the king actually ended up being the one who did it with the people guiding. The Magna Carta, by the way, um, people say that protects everyone. It actually didn't. The Magna Carta, when it was in England, didn't protect the peasants. It only protected the sovereign lords. So understand that the Magna Carta was only ever a document that gave rights to the barons and the lords and the business people. It didn't actually give rights to everyone else, if you actually go back and look at it properly. The Bill of Rights was a different kettle of fish because that did give significant um, rights to the people and came about after the horrible um, King Charles era of the 1600s in the Star Chamber. But in the results of the Star Chamber was the Bill of Rights, Magna Carta, gave extraordinary level of rights and protection for people under common law, and that became the English law. That's why, by and large, compared to many countries where we've seen atrocities, although we've had our own problems, we've by and large been a lot better off in the West um, because of the Magna Carta. And all these um, statutes or documents, they came under God, Almighty God, or under Christ. Um, I'm not talking about religion or whatever else. In fact, quite the contrary. They were very opposed to the Catholic Church if you read the history of the English and how the Magna Carta and that came in. It was very much a more pure kind of spirituality to Almighty God, to the Christ, um, and to the higher frequencies. So the constitutions have generally come in in America and everywhere else to um, protect the rights of the people and exist to stop government overreach. That's why they exist, to stop government overreach. And generally, they can only be suspended or given up by mutual agreement, like you join the military, navy, or business. So the principles of common law is life, liberty, property. And I'm going to be debunking some theories. There's going to be good news and some news that probably you won't want to hear today on this kind of stuff, because there's a lot of people going around talking about the common law, and that's the true law and our only rights. And I take a differing view. I do agree in principle with it, but we've got some other problems that we have to look at first to address, to make sure that works effectively. So life, liberty, property, that is by and large the pure law, which supersedes all other law, like the admiralty law, business law, anything else. So unless a law impinges on someone else's life, their liberty or hurts your property, it's not a real law. So things like speeding fines, mass fines, none of that actually is in any way common law. It's a contract or statute law. That's how it actually works. So common law came from the common sense or law of Moses and ultimately England. And like I said, it was a life, liberty, property, actual thing. Um, civil admiralty was a dictatorship, law of the sea, military law, only for times of extreme emergency or by voluntary conscription or whatever else or civil subscription or agreement. So martial law was like, for example, you got World War II, a country's about to invade you and shoot everyone and bomb everyone. So governments then implement martial law to go, okay, shit, we've got to you know, get some people quick smart to um, join, up with the, um, join up with us and actually make sure we've got a decent army to fight. So that's generally why martial law or admiralty law was where you voluntarily join the Navy um, things like that, as an example. So common law is the pure free law and ultimately goes back even deeper to what I call the law of Moses, God's law, the law of the creator. That's actually what it does. And that is the purest law. Now, England, as I said, was a common law country. It's really important to see a very good example of this here. England was a common law country, life, liberty, property. In 1290, after King Edward, um, and you won't find this in the history books. This was something I had to find through deleted um, books and through my movement. But England was free of the Rothschilds from that period. And when I say Rothschilds, I mean just that kind of energy or people, like the banking kind of fraternity, the ones who control the banking system. It's actually not, it's actually a group called the Khazarians. That's a whole different thing. Um, they basically kicked them out. They cancelled their banking system and brought in the Renaissance and gave England a lot of its freedom. 
Unfortunately, in the 1600s, they moved away from all that and moved back into greed, debauchery, horrible laws, um, prosperity, things like that. And in 1666, the Rothschilds saw their chance. They went and they um, set fire to um, the city of London and the fire of London. They, and as the area was burning and an absolute mess um, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the area was ruined, they of course turned up you know, doing what they're still doing today, 350 years later. Didn't have a table, and you but the deal was the exchange was they were given part of England. So still to this day, you have the city of London, which is a separate city to the rest of England and the rest of London. So. Can you all hear me? I'm saying I froze. Can everyone hear? Yeah, you good now, Warren? You've, you've frozen a couple of times there. It's just dropping in and out. It's yeah, it's just cutting in and out a little bit. Um, okay, it's still doing it. I might try and move to a different spot. Um, it seems to be okay now, but you did just freeze. Okay, I'm just going to go to a different spot. Um, see how that goes. So this is, um, okay, is that better? How's that? Is that good, Steve? Yep, seems to be okay. Okay. So move to my office. Okay, so it's working now. Good. Okay. So what I was saying was that England was a common law country, free from the Rothschilds, um, and basically the um, common law country, the, what, I learned was, what I learned from the leader history books was that the Renaissance came in in about 1290 when Edward, King Edward basically dealt with Khazarian people. For 376 years, England was prosperous. It was in the Renaissance. It had a lot of liberties, but then they moved into the Bortry, Greed, and sure enough, the civilization collapsed. In 1666, the Rothschilds saw their chance they came in, set fire to the city of London, um, burnt it all up, and basically this is what I've worked out. And from there, they, um, like they do today, they came back to, they created a problem and created a solution. Um, like today, they create a pandemic and then offer a solution, being a inoculation. And sure enough, in 1666, um, they were given an area of England. So basically the city of London has two parts. There's the inner city of London that's owned by the Rothschilds and the Lord Mayor is in charge and the Queen and the King and, and, and Prince William must all go and bow to them before they can enter because they're a sovereign city. And then they've got the rest of, the, of England as a separate common law region. But the city of London, the Rothschilds basically own everything. They control Europe, control US, everything. Um, I'm curious, um, <laughs> Who's finding that all quite new? Uh, who's kind of a bit blown away by that and didn't know that, that there's actually a separate city? Because that section, separate city of London, um, by and large, controls the rest of the world. If you look into it, the banking system, um, and they control it. So effectively, there's a small little separate country in England that rules the world. And Revelation in the Bible actually talks about it in Revelation 18, that, that basically that city that controls the rest of the world. So that's what you've got going on right now. So DC is pretty, is exactly the same too, Mark. Yes, Washington DC is the same. It was 1865 that was set up after Lincoln was assassinated by um by the Jesuits and the, and the Rothschilds, and they then proceeded to set up a separate federal United States, which was used. But that's a whole different discussion. Um, so all the banks, Fleet Street, all that is completely owned by the Lord Mayor Rothschild and it's completely 100% separate. So yes, there's a lot to this mystery, everyone. It's well, well covered. So democracy, as I'm sure you've worked out by now, is a bit of an illusion, really. Um, democracy is just basically supposedly people voting, but all it means is the mass consciousness gets to vote and decide who gets in. Democracy, ironically, is probably one of the worst governments, potentially. It's the best if you've got a good conscious people group, but it's the worst if you've actually got what we've got going on today. So it gives the illusion of freedom. So totalitarianism is, of course, the other one, dictatorship. 
Um, I personally think it really comes down, yeah, Vatican City as well. I personally think that um, it really comes down to the consciousness of the people, uh, ultimately. So Australia's legal system, and look, like I said, this, I do actually know constitutional law. My father is an absolute genius in constitutional law. In fact, many of the politicians in WA know him very well. He used to do columns in the paper. He was one of the main experts in constitutional law. So I was fortunate to get a very good grounding from him. Um, but basically, the way the Constitution actually works is um, it's, yeah, so we've got states and, com and, 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 and Commonwealth ones or whatever else. The Commonwealth, um, people say it overrides the states, so it's not entirely true. It only does with certain things, so only with specific things. And many of these powers have been watered down anyway now. So <laughs> states have more autonomy than people think. And the reason why was at Federation, the states didn't want to give up all their power to a federation. So the agreement was Commonwealth only existed to basically give, to manage certain powers. Section 51 lists out those rights or powers. That was the purpose of actually doing it. But yeah, so the states and the Commonwealth, um, the states by and large have a lot of power. And that's why the states have having a national cabinet going on because there's certain things they can't do with this health thing without the states agreeing. Like they cannot impose a federal state of emergency or medical conscription upon all the states. So they have to get the states agreeing to what's going on by and large. And that's why you got the kind of nonsense and everyone all over the place and doing all that thing. So there's three branches of government and this is quite important to understand. And I'm telling you this to leading up to state of emergency and the next part. So you've got to understand this to understand what's going on right now. So the three branches of government, the executive, and I might just actually um, type this in just so you can see that. Um, executive is actually what's called the um, politicians who rule, so by and large, i.e. like the cabinet, um, things like that. Technically, if you read our constitution, we actually have a dictatorship with the governor general, and then we have representatives, but except for 1975 when Gough Whitlam was fired and they implemented that, by and large, they don't do it in, in real life. So the executive by and large, and it's meant to be a level of protection or what's called checks and balances. So the executive, although the politicians rule, they're limited by two things. The legislative, and that's the parliamentarians who have to pass the law, okay? And within that, there's an upper house and a lower house. Now, it depends on, on which state you're in or where you're at, but the upper house and lower house um, are by and large, the, up, so the upper house or lower house is the one who makes the laws, upper house approves them. So in the Commonwealth government, they're called the Senate. In the lower house, they're called the House of Reps. West Australia, for example, we've got the Legislative Assembly, which is the one down here, and up here we've got the Legislative Council. So these are the ones who actually pass the laws. Um, so, I mean, the executives are the ones who rule the laws, but they don't make the laws. Well, not in theory. I'll explain why one of the big problems we've been having going on right now. So, the executive the parliamentarians, legislature. So, this is why I groaned last year when in Victoria, it was a touch and go when they were going to approve the state of emergency in Victoria. I don't know if you remember it. And those three independents all, you know, gave up and they approved it. And that's when I knew where, where things were going to get worse than, you know, as worse as they could possibly get. Because right now, the politicians are just simply know this law. They know it very well. And they're doing that. So what's happening is they're going, they're passing the laws here for the state of emergency. So they go and pass the law. They pass the governing overriding legislation. Then what happens from there is that the executive can go and implement what the legislator passed and they've done it by effectively, um, you know, through what's called regulations, directives, or, st or what's called mandates or whatever else. So regulative directives or mandates. That's why you've got this um, horrendous mandates going on right now. The mandates are not law, they're executive directives. So for example, if you actually, which we'll get into shortly, how the state of emergency actually works. The legislative passes a law, um, the executive then goes to implement it. So they'll uh, implement the law, I mean, in theory, the judiciary is meant to strike out abuses, checks and balances. Now, unfortunately, when um, Freemasons and um, various other groups and um, 
whatever else is going on control region. Um, and look, I try and keep things very balanced. I mean, you can, it's something you can research yourself. Um, it's a whole different topic. But unfortunately, the judiciary hasn't been doing its job by and large. When it has done its job, it has helped things a lot. So right now, there are court cases going on around what's going on. And to basically see if they can, the judiciary has the power, say that the laws passed here don't actually work. Um, and they have to be struck down. And if they do that, the whole thing. And that's why I say Nathan Buckley from GNB Lawyers is taking a court case to go there to the high court, because only the high court can strike out government legislation. The lower courts can basically um, interpret um, laws and they can give an opinion on the law when it's not really clear. But the high court then comes out and says and makes a decision on the laws and whether it's valid or not. So the aim of the judiciary is meant to do that. So it's critical now, if the judiciary does stop properly, the high court can stop this stuff. So that is, a, that is, they can stop it because they can hold at the foundation. That's why Clive Palmer tried to take West Australia to court, for example, and argue that the whole um, state of emergency, that the whole rules were disproportionate for what they had done. And everyone kept saying he was going to win. I, I, at the time, said he actually won't win because the only way he would win this case is if he can prove and the government accept that the whole pandemic is just a whole big scam. And I said, and if you presume the pandemic is correct, which I said right now, the High Court probably would, I said, well, I can't see, I think that the state border control measures are perfectly proportionate with managing a pandemic. It's extremely, if you go back through history, and again, people don't know the history. They just read the internet and think that they're an expert. But in history, um, lockdowns are a lot more normal than people think in pandemic, border controls. That's, that's all been done many, 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 many times in the past. It's just we think, oh my God, this is the first time in history. No, it is not. This has happened before. So um, it's, just, it's just that generally in the past, the pandemics that this was done for, there were lots of people dying and like really bad shit happening. And I think Australia, we've had the princely sum of one person die this year. So no, I'm not saying about Clive Palmer, that a person who comment that I agree or disagree. I'm just simply making the comment about Clive Palmer, but he took on a court case. That's basically it. So regulations, directives, what they are is the executive then go ahead and issue a series of directives um, to the people or to, to how they be implemented. So as an example, how does state of emergency work? I'll go into that more shortly, but the laws get passed here. Executive then um, us from there, a mandate, um, the chief health officer who's a delegated authority under the executive then issues directives or regulations or mandates that follow the legislation. So, so you've either got to read the mandate or have the mandate struck out by holding the legislation that strikes it is invalid. If you can't do that, then you've got to, then the other option is to argue, for example, that the regulation is actually an invalid use of power under administrative law. So you can, for example, go to court and actually argue that the regulation or mandate is, a, is actually doesn't, is not disproportionate or is not proportionate to the legislation. So a state of emergency and some ridiculous mandate where everyone must stay locked up and, you know, can't leave their house or their toilet, you know, that might get knocked out, for example. Um, so that's how this basically works in simple terms. And all these topics are ones that could all be in themselves, you know? And like I said, there's so many internet experts, as I call them. And so just, I just warn you on that one, you're going to end up coming badly unstuck in this whole time if you get caught up with the internet experts and what I call the freedom fear fighters movement. And I'm not saying don't stand up, but you've got to stand up in a wise, educated, informed way and getting a genuine understanding. So that's how that works. And even going deeper in our legal foundations, you notice as an example, the King James Bible gives a lot of our laws like the Ten Commandments supports life, liberty, or property. Um, the rule of two or three witnesses in here is followed in the court. It's, uh, they swear on the King James Bible. Um, they, um, they use this in credit card companies enforcing the law, things like that. I use this in my own legal notices because I know this and they work very effectively. Um, the sons of God are free, protected for tax, and that's in pretty much every major Western common law churches and any kind of movements that are basically doing spiritual work are tax-free. Um, and that's why they have this thing 
where the those who accrue in the system are caught up compared to those who are not. So yeah, you're welcome to share the recording for those of you who are asking. Um, no problem with that. But like I said, shortly I'm about to go through some stuff that I won't be recording. Um, so in terms of what a state of emergency actually is, it was only ever meant to be for a temporary, it's a kind of form of extreme martial law, narrow time law, and it's designed to cope. And if you actually read the West Australian, for example, and because I'm a WA guy, and it'll be the same with every state, it's only meant to be for a um, for basically extreme situations. So let's say there's a bushfire that hit the city or cyclones are hit. So for a few days, or there's a foreign invasion or an alien invasion um, or an epidemic or something that's really hit severely, these are all examples. So that's a state of emergency. And the idea is to suspend civil rights and liberties for the period of a state of emergency for the purpose of protecting it. Because you can't, if you're having a bushfire happening and people's houses are about to be burnt, and basically people say, I've got my common law rights, I can sit here and do what I want. And, you know, I'm sitting here running my vegan protest in the middle of this road. It's like, no, I'm arresting you because you are stopping the firefighters, stopping the house, the city burning down. It's only meant to be for extreme circumstances to protect the, um, the, the city. Now, WA section 15 or 58 only gives a maximum 14 days. It's actually a well-written legislation. It actually is very clear on what the state of emergency actually is. So that's why WA, they just keep renewing it every 14 days because of this fact. Um, but it's only meant to be for a maximum 14 days. Now, the ex appoints the Emergency Management Commissioner, which is the Commissioner of Police, Chris Dawson. So Chris Dawson, that means, is, is basically in charge of the state along with the Chief Health Officer. And he then delegates his authority to the Chief Health Officer. So right now, West Australia, for example, the head of the state right now is Chris Dawson. Um, the chief health officer works underneath him and then the politicians are acting from direction from these guys. That's what's actually happening. So Mark McGowan, Roger Cook um, are by and large, you know, um, doing all that, but by and large are under them. It'll be the same in every state. So <clears throat> Lord Blackstone said, woe to the people whose government declares martial law in times of peace to remove their common law liberties. So, he knew what that meant. If you and it's hard to find Blackstone's commentaries now, the full true version of them. But you'll read clearly about how martial law worked, everything. So, generally, unfortunately, we're living out what Blackstone said in the 1800s, <clears throat> that the government has declared martial law in times of peace to remove our common law liberties. So, and unfortunately, people say, "Is this unlawful?" Well. I would more say it's an abusive process. That's more what I would say. You've got to be very careful here. It's real and it's happening. People say this is not lawful. Well, maybe, maybe not. The problem that you've got right now is this. The state of emergency legislation is permitted to be extended for as long as the pandemic is running. <clears throat> so provided they can keep the guys at the pandemic, so the only way you can possibly get that knocked out is you have to pretty much approve an abusive process and the pandemic and the government and the courts pretty much have to admit the whole thing's one big scam. Now, if any of you are willing to bet that will happen the next little while, um, you know, <laughs> all I can say is if you're going to do that, then you should go and put um, $100,000, you know, on the bottom team at winning um, the next World Series next year, you know, like someone like the Colorado Rockies, who are pretty shit, or Arizona Diamondbacks, because that's, you got about as much chance of that. So, yeah. Basically, this is legal. It's lawful as fuck. I hate to tell you, but it's legal. It may not be lawful. It's not lawful because it's um, horrendous abuse of process. But unless you can actually prove that the whole basis for the state of emergency goes against the ambit or intention of the legislation, which is to actually, um, you know, for the thing I've mentioned here, and it's being abused. And, uh, you know, and in Australia, you can definitely argue in theory, and I emphasize in theory, that it's a whole lot of nonsense because we had one person die. There's not anything going on, as, so to speak. But yeah, that's a, as you can see there, you're going to have to get the high court to get up and say the whole thing's a scam. Now, well, I hmm, don't know if that's going to happen in the next little while. It may happen at some stage, but I wouldn't say just yet. So, um, 
So until the foundation is overturned, it remains illegal and intact. In one of the, in an ancient proverb, it says, if the foundations of the law be destroyed, what can the righteous do? And there's a lot of truth in that. In the same proverb, it says, um, when the vilest men are exalted, the wicked walk on every side freely. And that's what's happening right now. Evil men and women, inferior energies are allowed to prosper. People who propose outrageous in violations, people who propose a whole idea, but on the one hand, you can go and be transgender and force your children to wear masks and be, and if they want to have the right to go and have a sex change at age five, they should be able to, at the same token, have been saying, you know, or that, you know, you have a right to consent, but then they're saying, oh, but you don't have a right to consent or, you know, we're going to coerce you for this jab. So you can see it's just straight out, um, it's evil shit. I mean, there's no other way to describe it, you know. Um, it says in um, one of the scroll of Isaiah, it says, woe to those who turn evil to good and good to evil. So what's happening right now is evil is good, good is evil. And like I said, unfortunately, um, I studied all this stuff. I worked this out years ago. That's why life, in all honesty, was a, was a horrible for me for many years. I'd almost given up at one stage because um, I just was fed up. And it's actually, at least now, it's good that people, that we're all waking up together and we can say, let's just kind of become educated. So Satanism, in Satanism, everything is done in reverse. So if you read the Satanic Bible, it's done in reverse. And good is made evil, evil is made good. That's why they do stuff that is pretty yuck. So that's what's going on right now. And unfortunately, um, this is going to take one heck of a fight to undo this. Um, so that's why I said you better make sure that you're ready for the, you're ready for the siege. In other words, like Lord of the Rings, like your city's under siege, you're going to have to get ready, stock up, and be under siege. That's the reality. So let's have a look now at what your rights actually are. Now, on that note, I'm going to go to the bathroom. Excuse the blunt and the frankness. I will be back in about less than a minute. all right folks just while we're taking a short intermission there with warren um how's everyone enjoying things so far the questions are coming in thick and fast um I see a lot of great feedback and comments there um and if you're enjoying just put a why in the chat and my screen has now frozen so i can't see that <laughs> there we go Yes, 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 great. Okay, now my, my screen's finally catching up. Hey, Katie Ray, good to see you. Down with the reptiles, yep. Yes, yes, great, fantastic. Um, I, I really did like Warren's question at the start about, um, um, you know, that slide he showed with the, the weirdos there. Um, I always consider myself a weirdo, so it's good to be, um, you know, amongst all the other, all your other weirdos, which is fantastic. So, um, Thanks for joining. Thanks for, for participating. And um, intermission is just about to finish. Mr. Palmer, how are you? Thank you. Back to you, Warren. Back to me, yeah. So, yeah, it's interesting. There was one, our 1,000 was hit like a minute before it started. So it's probably been about another 1,000 to try to join on. So hopefully people have shared the live stream from the page so people can jump on. But anyway... Um, yeah, there you go, hey. Yeah, it's nice with all the weird eyes, Warren. So we're, we're in good company by the looks of it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Can't believe how many people want to listen to me, Steve. Far yeah. out. Weird. Yeah, well, Come like on. I said, lots of weird eyes around, eh? Hey? We're all here. I'd love to say it's my good looks, but I somehow don't think that's the truth. Uh, let's move on, hey. Let's not answer that. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, what are your rights? Or 
Not a lot, but that's why let's start with this, because this is the true order of creational rights. That's why I said the, the first starting point to I actually make a difference is to understand this thing I'm about to show you now. Okay, this was my starting point. When I got this, life changed for me. It took a while for me to actually implement this and live it, but really listen to what I'm telling you here. This is a profound secret or truth that if you get this, you know, to do that. So Michelle says, a friend waiting for approval of your Facebook group to listen. So yeah, maybe just people can go and check that and just approve people who need approving. Um, so God created man or woman. Now, look, when, whatever you call God, there's a council of gods, the source, infinite intelligence. If you're Christian, you'll see it one way. If you're Hindu, another way. But God created man or created women um, as a sovereign being. With accountability to God, and I emphasize that, people will say we are our own God and we can do what we want. That's just not true. It really isn't. And it's, yes, we can, we are in a way gods, but there are higher councils and orders. And the more I've studied higher teachings, it definitely is orders and spiritual authorities and energetic planes that run things and all stuff like that. So definitely there is some kind of, um, you know, God or higher force and definitely these higher senior management or councils, which have higher moral laws like life, liberty, and property, higher laws of um, how we treat one another, the law of love. And then in truth, um, from there, what men and women do is we create governments. So we create, so in theory, governments are just simply like local councils or community groups or groups of people who we agree are wise respected people in the community who oversee and make decisions on what's going on for the community so rather than everyone just doing what they want which once you've got thousands of people living in the same city or millions that just would it wouldn't work you just have a rabble so you create governments you create councils community groups or orders and the purpose of these groups is to govern the conduct and create laws that are agreed by all to actually, um, yeah, to actually make for the benefit of all people. So that's the purpose of, of it there, to do that. So to give law, so law in principle is a good, good thing. You know, it's a really good thing. Um, it's, but unfortunately, why to a civilization when these governments, start to get ruled or influenced by corporations, or we use this term loosely, the deep state, but corporate groups that fund, that bribe, that influence the government and that run them in the background, tell them what to do. And then effectively the government then turns people into slaves rather than acting for the will of the people, which is what the original Australian constitution, when you read it in section seven, representatives were elected to represent the people. So that is the purpose of it. But unfortunately, this is what happens when governments can do that very thing and they stop doing that. But you first got to come back to know that you know, and this can take some time and spiritual work. This is why I went on years of pilgrimages and spiritual searches to discover my inner sovereignty. Once I discovered my inner sovereignty, it became a lot easier to manifest it in the outward. I, I notice when I go places and I talk to cops and governments, I just don't have the problems other people have because I've learned this, but it was a time I had all the problems. You know, I had run-ins, I would have this, I would have aggressive authorities towards me, but not anymore, quite the contrary. Um, I have found I've had very favorable experiences with authorities in recent times. And that's just because they know people we can feel energy. So people know when you have your power, you meet someone and know they've got power and authority. And, um, and you get authority and power by knowing your inner sovereignty and your inner truth. And that is why it's really good when there's diversity of people, by the way, because you need to have different groups of people. I love certain people in my business who are the kindest people and in my group. You know, they're, they're inclusive people. Steve Plummer, who's on here, Steve's just a terrific guy. He really is. I mean, we give each other crap, but Steve is a terrific guy, you know. And um, Gracie is, you know, wonderful. And then we've got, say, um, you know, Edward, who's my son, he manages things and different people. Then I have various women in my life and women I know. And the feminine can be so nurturing. And so let's heal the people. Let's just help people. Let's not give up on people. 
and we need those people. You know, you need people who are willing to do that. And equally, though, you need people who are a little bit more at hardcore masculine who say no. And that's why I just decided, well, there's plenty of people who are not like me, so I may as well be me. And, yeah, I'm a pretty black and white person, and I don't put up with nonsense. I really don't. I, um, I pretty much automatic, I unfriend people instantly if they annoy me just because I feel like it. I um, just decide one day I want to unfriend someone for no good reason, use, sometimes unreasonable. And if someone annoys me with their messages, I decide one day I just send them to spam. And then I usually get over it or sometimes and smile and move on. So it's knowing yourself and being comfortable. And since I've done that, by the way, my health has been magnificent. My life's been really good. <laughs> and I've just been enjoying life, you know? And so, yeah, anyway, it's knowing who you are. That's the, that's the order of creation. And knowing that inevitably throughout history, you've always had this kind of shit going on at most of the time. So one of the things I learned was being a public um, servant, not a master. In other words, government officials are public servants in principle. So whenever I'm talking to someone, I don't have to go around saying, you are only a public servant. I just go, well, you're a public servant. You're here to serve me. And that's the mentality I deal with people by. And you're just doing your job. I think for me, what helped was having worked in the tax office for 10 years. I was a normal guy. When I was a tax auditor, I was actually really fair with people. And I remember one day having someone abuse me on the phone. I was trying to be fair with him. So I was so mad. I just said, let's write a book at this guy. So one thing I've learned is most public servants are just doing their job. They really are. You've got a few who are corrupt, but a lot of them are just normal got people doing their job, just got a mortgage to pay, got kids with special needs, got health problems, got financial challenges going on. And really just, you know, I remember being, when I was audited by the tax office the first time, they, I think one of the reasons they were so kind was I noticed that the auditor was having neck problems. So I mentioned it to him. He goes, yeah, I am actually. And I told him how I fixed my neck up. And he was very grateful and said, look, I'd love to get all the details. And so I spent about five or two minutes telling him how to fix his neck up. And because I didn't like seeing him in pain. And I, as you can imagine, after that, he was very kind to me. So first and foremost, you know, um, it's just um, realizing that, that they are servants, but, you know, there's no need to be antagonistic. There really isn't. Um, and that one thing can make your life a lot easier. If you want to be antagonistic, you're better off to join a rage freedom movement because antagonism will only create more antagonism. It's laws of energy. If you push out, if I'm angry towards you and start swearing and screaming at all of you, what are you going to do? Instinctively, you'll feel the same back and want to give it back. Either that or you'll withdraw into yourself. So the three maximums of commercial law that are useful to know, and there's all different teachings, is that law can't compel performance. Now, that's one of the reasons why I kind of have a bit of a chuckle when I, you know, read what they're doing, bringing the military in for the jab. I do see the funny side of it because they know these principles. I can see it. So that's why they're doing everything to try and offer incentives. Today they came out and actually said they're going to offer incentives. They're going to offer, you know, Flight, freaking flyer points, um, cash bonuses, prizes. Um, I, I couldn't stop laughing. I thought, you know, that's you can just see they know this and they're trying to get as many people to voluntarily consent as they can. Um, every single law must have a remedy. That's the other thing here too. Like everyone must have a remedy. Um, he who leaves the field a battle first contents by default, i.e. do nothing is acceptance. So that is why you've got to be very careful as well when you get confronted by an official. You've really got to address the matter and not just leave things. That's one of the things I've learned as well. This, this one thing, number two, is what helped me, for example, have a pretty smooth run. Masks haven't bothered me, not because I've done any anti-masking. I, In my case, as it turns out, I have a black and white you know, exemption, which I'll go into um, soon. But like I said, it's just knowing that every law must have a remedy. And when you read the mandates, directives, and the laws they do i'm personally convinced that most of our citizens don't read any of them like in west australia right now you know for example um there's this um they've lifted our lockdown now they've lifted our mask thing pretty much everywhere and people are still you know um are walking around wearing masks so i think well the only reason they could be doing that is they didn't actually realize that they were lifted yesterday so anyway every law must have a remedy Okay, so I'm just going to stop recording just for the bit now. Like I said, this is the party. I'm going to go to some deeper stuff. So can we just stop the recording now, guys, and let me know once it's done. Just take the mic and just tell me it's done. And then I'll... 
Okay, so it's back on. So good, we can re-live stream it. Um, someone did ask, which I will answer, although I wasn't going to ask going along, do you think the jail will be mandated to get the pension? Yeah, look, I would say every possibility. I think any financial benefit, I'd be very surprised if they don't. So, okay, so continuing to move through. Um, okay, this is from my experience as a lawyer and from having a sister who's a criminal lawyer. So we've already mentioned this here. Sovereignty means you govern yourself. No one else can govern you whatsoever. So I'm just going to give you some quotes about helping you to stay calm and be centered. So plan for what is difficult while it is easy. Do what is great while it's small. In other words, right now you've still got time to get financially sovereign before you wake up one day and they've reset the whole financial system and, they, and you won't get any money unless you've been jabbed. We're not at that stage. So plan for when it's going to be ugly now, okay? Do what is great while you can do it. It's still, the one good thing of Australia is, as I joke, I said the politicians here couldn't even run the clowns on the circus, let alone manage the whole rollout. And because we're so far behind, I think we have more time in Australia. We really do. So the supreme art of war is to subdue the enemy without fighting. So that's what, by and large, the authorities are doing with us, by and large, as the people. Um, someone here to learn, says not learned a thing. Um, can you please remove him from the webinar? Thank you. So the supreme art of war is to subdue an enemy uh, without fighting. So that is the aim, to win this, being this war without any kind of fighting whatsoever. So that's... That's why I don't see this as, um, although there is a fight, in another sense, I'm not really fighting. I am just doing inward shifts and balancing. It's important to outthink your enemy than to fight him. Sometimes we need to lose the small battles in order to win the war. Um, okay, this is the big lesson. <clears throat> Appear weak when you're strong and strong when you're weak. So that's one of the reasons why if I'm, when I'm confronted, I honestly play really dumb. I really do. I play like I'm simple and play. I don't go around. If you go around saying I am, if I went around, I'm telling you now, and said on Facebook, I am Warren Black. I am the greatest freedom fighter. I'm here to rescue Australia. I think I would probably have <clears throat> cops, authorities. I'd probably become the most watched person <laughs> in Australia. So <laughs> I'd have to be pretty dumb to do that. But unfortunately, many people you go down that path, and that's maybe part of their karmic path. So, <clears throat> appear weak. In other words, this is a time right now to focus on yourself and mastering the law for yourself, getting really familiar with it, okay, and getting out of fear. That's the main thing I really wanted to share today and why I wanted to do the webinar, to teach what I can. And obviously, there's so much to teach. This will take weeks to actually teach all this. And I'm going to, in all honesty, I'm definitely going to be doing more. That's why I'll be sharing at the end and going on specific topics and doing that over the coming weeks. I'll definitely do that. Today is more just an overview on all the different topics. So appear weak when you are strong and strong when you're weak. And I've said it about four times because it is so important. You're better off to focus on your family, on your life, and on really getting yourself um, in a good position right now and getting yourself ready for what's ahead. Because really we have only just begun in what's going to be in what we'll be encountering in the days ahead and i think you would all know what i'm saying i think there's so much more to play out in this saga and i think a lot of it's going to be very challenging so <clears throat> main thing is to that so and when plunder becomes a way of life this is what happens so this is what we're dealing with right now a legal system that moral that authorizes it and a moral code that glorifies it Life, liberty, and property do not exist <clears throat> because men have made laws. It was the fact that life, liberty, and property existed that caused men to make laws in the first place. So that's the thing. So unfortunately, this is what's happening. People have lost respect for the law. Um, this is a classic. I think this is one of the problems we're dealing with. People thinking that what's going on is okay because the law says it's okay. Well, there's been some pretty bad violations of legal rights in history that I'm sure many of you have heard about, like in the 1300s, it was the right of the English kings and the soldiers to be able to have sex with the virgin brides on their wedding day before the husband, you know, things like that. So just because it's a law doesn't mean it's in any way 
a right law. And you do, unfortunately, as the American Revolutionist says, there is definitely a time to push back, but we've got to push back with wisdom. So unfortunately, many are making this choice. Um, unfortunately, people are afraid of the government, which means there's tyranny right now. So, okay, so what to do if you're basically um, confronted? Number one is stay centered and balanced. This is probably the big one, if you're confronted by cops. So stay centered and balanced, okay? And like I said, above all else, remain calm and don't kind of get belligerent at cops because, like I said, they will get belligerent back with you and frequently, and I can tell you knowing to be a public servant, what that will mean. So you've got to go prepared. I mentally practice what would happen. Even though I've never been confronted by a cop, I have mentally practiced over and over again. I've written out arguments. I've written them out in my mind. I've written out what I would say to them. I've worked it all out because if you're confronted in a moment and you're not ready for it, you're going to be caught out. You're going to go dumb. So you've got to really practice yourself. Practice exactly how you respond. If you can feel fear when you're responding, when you're practicing at home, then keep working on it till you find wording and find a response that will work for you. I know I worked out it would be something like this. It would be something as simple as, thank you very much. I understand you're doing your job because they really are. They're just doing their job. And I understand you're acting, you know, in the state of emergency and you're doing your job. Um, I, I personally take a different approach. I say, I, yep, I do have a, an exemption if I ask me further. I, and the key is not to give more information away than you're asked. You're only what's legally required. The main reason why people who get fined and get these brutal arrest you here is because they refuse to answer under a state of emergency, which it's like being in the army under martial law and refusing to obey a superior. You're going to get put in the brig. And that's what we're in right now. So if you stay straight out, nope, I'm not talking to you or be belligerent, yeah, but very good chance you'll be arrested and be one of those stories on the front page. So I always say, yep, no problem. I do have an exemption. I wouldn't say any more than that. If they've been asked me, um, what is your exemption for? I would tell them. I'd say, I'm happy to tell you, uh, provided we understand my right to privacy um, under this legislation, but I don't have a problem telling you, provided it's obviously a confidential thing, this is my medical condition, and I tell them. If they say to me, I would like to see a written medical exemption, in my case, I've got one, so I'd show them. If I didn't have one, which at one stage, I almost was going to have to see a cop, and this was in the lockdown in February in, in, um, February in WA, and I even said to the guy at um, the restaurant owner who was pushing the matter with me, I said, I'm quite happy for you to ring the police right now, have the police come around and see me, and I'll explain it to them. As soon as I said that, he goes, oh, look, look it's okay, then that's fine, you can come in. And that was because I confronted my, my, my demon and my fear head on. I just said, bring the cop around. I don't have a slightest problem, you know, bring him around. And I would just said the same thing. I've got a medical exemption, and I would say, this is what the medical exemption is. And I said, the way I understand the state of emergency mandate, and so you know, I've actually got my phone. I've screenshotted all the relevant legislation, the relevant provisions of myself. The main one I've done is the mask, is the actual mandate for the mark and the exact exemption. And I would just read the exemption out to them. That's what it says there. And it even says it's a reasonable thing, but doesn't actually have any requirement. And my understanding is it's not required for me to do that. Is that not so? And then they kind of then have to wait and say that's not the case. My, my experience in that situation is that having seen that and knowing people who've done that, is that that would usually work. If they were really pushy, well, then it comes down to how you handle it from there. I had a situation where yesterday my father was rushed to hospital in a fairly serious situation. I um, went down to the hospital. I, just, I made a decision. What I did myself was, because um, I was walking right through the area, even though I didn't have to, I thought, you know what? I put the mask on, but not on my nose. I just put it over my mouth. And I just did that. I was asked by one security guard. I smiled and said, I do have a medical exemption. And she cracked up and said, why you got over your mouth? I said, ah, uh, not to draw attention. I just want to see my father right now. The truth was I was more keen to see my father because he wasn't well, um, rather than a confrontation. So... You know, that was the that was the reality. So sometimes in situations you do that. So I will remain calm, remain neutral, you know, and 
what to do if arrested is the next one. This is from my sister, who's a criminal lawyer. Um, I learnt this one, obviously that one there. The 99% rule, I learnt this from a prosecutor as well as my sister, but I especially learnt that from a prosecutor. 99% of successful prosecutions that happen in court for offences are because of what you blurt out in the first meeting or two when you're with him out of fear or out of anger. Um, even though you have a right to remain silent, very few people actually use that or even know much about that anymore. There's a good reason for that. 99% of prosecutions happen because it's like, well, I just did this and all I was doing was that and all I was doing was that and you just give everything away. So I, when, I always answer very exactly, very slowly, and I only answer. I was in an ASIC investigation about three years ago and I was asked, uh, and the people who'd gone in before me, there was a whole lot of things to do with an investment scheme, even though I wasn't really involved, I had been the accountant and so they wanted to question me. Everyone who was questioned spent four to five hours and came out traumatized. I was out within an hour and a quarter, they were apologizing to me and they were, they were talking to me about cryptos and I made a good laugh. And the reason why, I walked in there, I did say to my sister come in with me and she just said to me, shut your mouth. And she said, only answer what they answer and never lie. Never lie to authority, just answer exactly. <clears throat> so for example, they say to me, did you, were you, were you aware of the money that was transferred offshore? No, I wasn't. That's it. Were you aware? Did you, have you heard the name of this party? Yes. Have you ever had any dealings with this client and what they did with that client? No. Have you ever seen their trading account and gone through statements? No. So you can see I answered literally one word, two words, three word answers. So that I kept, I was honest, but I answered exactly. When I was tax audited, I did the same thing, kept my answers to a minimum. The one time I broke that rule was in the legal practice board audit. I tried to be helpful in the first meeting and spent three years fighting it. And my QC, I got to help me, actually said to me, I wish you hadn't done that stupid first letter. He said, honestly, he said to me, you're an idiot. I said, yeah, I know. And he said to me, I would have had this finished in a month. I said, yeah, I know. So that was, um, you know, my whole thing. So 99% of prosecutions happen. The police have enough idiots to prosecute. Um, and if you're one of the 1% but are smart and shut your mouth, you'll by and large be left alone. So you have the right to remain silent and you really should use it if you're arrested. Like that doesn't mean be belligerent and just say nothing. Um, I choose not to, but I really keep my answers very, very brief, very brief. If I'm told the police want to come and get me in for an interview, I'm like, that's fine. I want my lawyer present or I speak to my lawyer, find out and I'll keep my answers so, so limited. So that's probably the, the greatest tip I can ever give you. So if you listen to that, you'll make a very, very big difference. So remain calm. If you get a letter telling you or you get called, you've got to come in and see, we want to check something into you. The instant panic that you feel, breathe deeply and really kind of think about what you're going to say and what you're not going to actually say. I, I cannot emphasize this enough. This has saved me and many of the clients I've worked with over the years, just learning to be smart and not give too much away. Okay, so we are coming towards the um, you know last part. So practical survival tips. Know the times and seasons you're in. So every time there is a season, okay? And the season right now, as I said, unfortunately, by and large, this is going to go on for a bit longer. And if you really tune in and look at the truth, you'll probably know this is correct. You know, it's going to... Unfortunately, it's going to keep going for a while. It's an ugly time. It's not a pleasant time. It's a time to love, a time to hate. It's a time for everything. Right now, it's a time for war. It's a time to stand up for your rights. It's a time where there's going to be forces trying to take everything from you. And you're going to have to be strong. Have a strong mindset. Really work on yourself. That's why one of the things I'm going to mention at the end, we do run these weekly webinars and we're going to be running more and things like that. And the weekly ones is very much about teaching higher principles, mindset, spiritual awakening. Um, we're going to be teaching more about the rights kind of area. I plan to do more about that kind of stuff and how the law works. Um, things like that. You've just got to be educated. You've got to be empowered and you just got to be mentally strong and spiritually very, very strong. So that's the main thing there, you know? Um, 
standing up. So you've got to be able to stand up for yourself. And if you've got boundary issues from your childhood, like I did, I had a mum who didn't particularly regard my boundaries at all growing up. And I'm sure some of you could relate to that. Um, so I had a lot of trouble um, refining my boundaries energetically as well as mentally. And it was the main reason I became a lawyer. But yeah, learning to stand up for yourself. And the way you start is by practicing in small things. Um, practice, you know, like you said, going into a shop and um, if you really do believe in this and you are exempt or whatever else, that you go in there and, you know, just pa practice patiently being able to stand up for yourself. And if you fail, don't beat yourself up. If you muck it up, just go away and see what you did, what you did well and what you would change next time. Um, other practical survival, I've got a backup internet because I've got Telstra, but I've got a backup one now. I expect that you're going to have various internet outages. You're already having bank outages right now. I, I hope I'm wrong, but it could well be a bit of a test, a test, you know, um, basically to try some things out and get people ready for this. Um, they've been talking about a cyber pandemic where you're going to see breakdowns of all this kind of stuff and grids, and we saw it in America with fuel. I have no doubt that there's a very good chance at some level this is going to happen in some parts of the world. I think Australia, you may well see the same thing. Um, so, yeah, I've got two internet providers, electricity. I'm looking at getting a generator myself. So I've got a backup electricity source if that goes down for days. I'm even going as far as to buy a camper trailer with solar power. I'm looking into getting one of those. That's one of my things to actually um, be able to have that alternative power, go out if I need to. Um, growing my own food, I'm doing stuff around that now. So like I said, being electricity, growing my own food. Um, that's the next thing I'm doing. I've got a guy coming next week and we're going to be increasing that as well. Um, so, yep, being able to do that, grow your own food learn to be independent, learn some basic survival skills. I'm even going to be doing some of that myself. Um, and look, I hope that all of this is a complete overkill, just to be clear. Like, I really, really do. Um, oh, I think my battery is low. Hang on, I'm going to have to get my um, cord. I'll keep talking, but I'm going to turn my video before I get my battery. So, yeah, I hope this is an overkill. Uh, I would be definitely recommending things like that. Um, Water is definitely a very big concern right now, as an example. Um, that's something as well, like, do you have a rainwater tank? If not, look about it. Do you have an escape place you can go in the country? And again, that may not be necessary. It may not be, and hopefully it's not. And hopefully this is an overkill. But I see it like insurance. I don't plan to crash my car, and I really hope I don't. But I've got car insurance in the unlikely event that I do happen to crash my car, like I did some years ago. So that's how I see this. You know, I don't expect to get a major health condition in the next little while, but if I do, I do have some health insurance. So it's just things like that. You really just want to be well prepared in what's coming up. Um, cash as well. Do you have some cash at home? Big one. You must, must, must do that. Um, have some cash because. I can tell you now that that's a very big vulnerability because one of the things that inevitably happens in Australia, I'm sure you've heard about this thing called the, um, you know, Bank Bailin Act, I'm trying to find it, but yeah, there's a thing called the Bank Bailin Act. I, I had a slide here, I thought, but it doesn't seem to be here. Um, yeah, you want to basically, um, that means at some stage, as, as just as inevitable as this biosecurity emergency, in the next few years, you're going to have to bail up the banks, the banks will crash, they'll be shut, and there'll be a bank run. That's that's going to happen. So I'd be recommending you have at least two weeks, preferably four weeks, living expenses in cash at home, at least. Um, minimum two weeks, ideally about four weeks, um, at least, even eight weeks. So that would that would be my tip for everyone. Have some cash. Does it mean that what happens if they cancel cash completely, go, go electronic? Well, that's the risk you take. But, you know, it's like anything, you, you, you're hedging your risk. Income. Now, if you are dependent on big corporate or things like that, you really want to get sovereign income streams. Is it hard work? Yeah, if you've grown up in jobs and spent most of your life in jobs, it's a hard change. I found it very hard, you know. But um, I reckon that um, income streams or whatever else, I, in terms of how far away this all is, I personally think there's a very good chance 
around 2023, a lot will happen because that's 90 years after the Great Depression's financial reset. And generally there seems to be around about a 90 year cycle and round numbers. So I'm predicting that there'll be some kind of reset or major change in around 2023 or 24. That's my feeling. It may even happen next year, but I think that's less likely. Um, things like I taught my kids, for example, to actually, um, you know, trade. Um, like one of my kids is going to trade, another one's been in business. None of my sons have ever had a job. I've got four boys, not one of them has ever had a job. And I've just told them, you know, you want to be very sovereign and do the hard things now. My 12, when I, my son, one of my sons was 12, you know, he was doing stuff. Another one at 14, they were doing businesses at that age and learning and learning. Now one of them is making very good income running all of these companies that I run. The other one now trades cryptos and does very, very well. And the other one's a spiritual teacher. And then the youngest one is a bum, but he's a great guy. So, you know, and but no doubt he will um, change in his own good time. So learn a skill, something you, you want to do, like income, a business, a job, get some mentoring if you have to, like I did. It doesn't matter. Um, you've just got to get yourself a really good income and teach your kids, for goodness sake, to do the same thing. Um, I just said, but my kids are saying, I'm so glad we don't have to go to uni or looking for jobs because God, you know, they said, we can see the, the vulnerability we'd actually have. I'm like, yeah, you know, they all think the whole thing's stupid, but they're very relieved. And they even said to me, God, we thought you were nuts as parents at times. And they did, but they said, we're really glad you and mum were so like this with us. So income stream, getting some education around your assets, for example, People say there's a magic solution, like put it in gold or whatever. The truth is we don't know. For all we know, the apocalypse could be so bad, but like we did in 1932, when Franklin Roosevelt sees everyone's gold in America, they could just simply round up the army and come and take everyone's gold in Australia and US, that could happen. So no, gold is not the solution. I mean, it's a necessity I recommend, or, you know, if I can't advise, so I'll rephrase that. One of the things I do is see gold as a very um, important part because historically, frequently gold is a very good store of value and it tends to hold its value. Just keep in mind that um, uh, what, one of the things we teach in our wealth club, which is one of the businesses I run, is to make sure you've got, um, you know, consider having gold offshore as well as onshore, just in case there's a big gold grab that happens in your country. So cash is generally pretty good, but if they reset everything and go into a great reset, well, yeah, that might not work either. So the whole idea is to actually have um, a balanced portfolio and getting some good financial kind of help and really doing smart things to protect your risk or whatever else. That's the other thing for you to do too. Um, so what next is civilization? I mean, I'm coming to the end now. Like I said, I've just, I could feel everyone was pretty keen. Wanted to give as much as I could. We've got this here, um, all this happening. I think, unfortunately, a lot of people get sick and die, most likely. That's the probable events of all of this. Um, I've just chosen to, you know, you can get yourself all worked up and be bawling your eyes out and so sad, um, or you can just kind of get on with it. And like what I'm doing here, my way of doing what I can is educating more people. The fact that, you know, it looks like about 2,000 will be listening to this webinar at some stage, great. If even one thing helped any of you and you go out and share with someone else, that can shift the energy of this, you know? And if you all go out and share it like you're doing and we do more trainings and you come along, you can make a difference. Or if someone else comes and um, does this, you know, and does your part. So everyone just does their part, you know? And don't judge anyone for not doing their part. I know some have asked me, if you used to be a great lawyer, why don't you go to court? And I say, it's not my path. Um, it really isn't. My path is to educate, show people the way, and that's what I enjoy doing. When I was a lawyer, I avoided court by and large, except in the occasional fun little venture. So that's very much, it's knowing your path and staying within your path and doing what you're best at doing. So we mentioned about the cyber pandemic, there's gonna be a collapse of the markets, um, bank, bank running, bail-in act, this was a slide here, um, banks going for a run, yes, this was the Great Depression, what happened, people running on the banks, and then we've got this great reset. And yeah, we do have a whole training on the Global Wealth Club as well. So um, we have a, on, our, on our YouTube channel. So 
this is a big concern I can see myself. I I've been I learned this in 1988. This is where I think the end game actually is. Um, I think all this other stuff is the foreplay leading up to what I see as the real problem. Um, I'm sure many of you have heard of the Mark of the Beast or this kind of stuff here, which, um, you know, it's basically some pretty damaging times. So, yeah. So basically, this is the basic look. And I know in 1988, in 1984, Henry Davis actually had a technology. They were already developing the technology to do this in 1984. I know that for a fact, just from contacts and things like that. So this has been in place and ready to go for a very, very long time. So this thing, which you're reading, is in my view, the end game. And it's the unfortunate, you know, reality is to do that. And I'm sure by now many have seen this particular passage where it says he calls us all both small and great, rich and poor, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, they're already doing it in parts of the world. It's already happening. Uh, and that no one would sell unless they had this mark or the name of the beast or number of his name. So, yeah, I reckon that that's the end game. And the reality is, if you're not strong enough to stand up right now with masks and jabs, you're not going to have a lot of chance to, you know, and if you're willing to give up your freedom to basically just so you can travel, so you can have a jab, I wouldn't like to think where you'll be at is suddenly they want to microchip you and take control of your brain. They've reset the economy and they said you can't eat, you can't do anything unless you've got this. Now, that's obviously a very extreme scenario, but you can't rule that out right now with what's going on. You just can't. You know, I'd like to think I'm being an extremist. Someone says you're being such an extremist. Well, hopefully, hopefully I'm really going too far with this. So that would be good if I was going too far. <clears throat> that would actually be overall, I'd be more than happy to be very, very wrong on this one and for life to have an amazing change. But right now, this is being predicted. It's been happening and... If something crazy that's been predicted is actually playing out before your eyes, you can no longer say it's a conspiracy or it's a tinfoil hat or whatever else you want to call it. Because it's actually really happening in the real world right now as we speak. And now, and it's getting like more insidious. You can see now on phones now, contact tracing now. Yeah, in some parts of Australia, they're saying you've got to actually carry your phone now. In China, they do that. Um, it doesn't really take much of a step to then say, you know, you've got to have it to reset the economy and have a digital f currency on your phone. And then it doesn't take another too much after that to talk about, you know, giving you the option to voluntarily put it uh, as a microchip because this way, you know, if you lose your phone, it's a problem. But this way, it's so much better because if you don't, this way, you can be rest assured that you're protected from someone stealing your phone, like whatever else. Um, and then from there, it gradually becomes mandatory or voluntary. So I do think, unfortunately, that's where we're heading. And like I said, I really hope that we're wrong. And I do, that at the same time, my study of spiritual literature and prophetic literature does suggest that there will be parts of the world that will be protected from this, that will rise up and become sovereign, but there will be a minority rather than a majority. That's what my research seems to suggest. So I am hoping that... Australia chooses to be one of those places. So this is what leads on the spiritual awakening to finish off now, finalizing before we kind of take the questions or whatever. So I saw something like a sea of glass mixed with fire and those who overcame the beast's image and number of his name standing on the sea of glass having harps of God. So there's four things that you can see here, the beast. So that, So this is the thing for the spiritual awakening. And it's necessary, like lower vibrational entities, antichrist government systems, or really just lower nature or mind. But a lower mind, that kind of what's called that debauchery side, that side that wants to control, that greed, that profiteering side, things like that. You know, so overcoming your lower mind and actually moving into your higher mind, that's a, that's a good way of putting it. So you actually learn to move into your higher nature, your more, the law of love, your um overcoming that to move into a higher what's called christ of nature and christ krishna buddha many of these people one of the teachings in the hindu is hindu and the buddhists and in the kriya yoga teachings is that whenever humanity moves into a period of darkness they set saviors or higher vibrational masters get sent from higher realms to as saviors to awaken humanity 
and guide them basically through it to the truth. And Christ came to his people. Krishna came to India when it was in spiritual darkness and guided them into a new religion, a new spirituality. Buddha did the same with his people. Um, there's many others, Zoroaster. There's a number of different um, saviors, Messiah. There was Babaji who came to the Indian people as well. There was a Kriya Yogi lineage, Sri Yaketswa, Yogananda, Lahiri Mahasaya. I studied and loved their stuff. They always bring tears to my eyes, these guys. Great, great teachings. Buddhist masters like Dipama, who put the um, Buddhist teachings to the people because the Buddhist teachings, like the Kriya Yoga, at one stage they taught that you had to renounce the rest of the world and go and live in the mountains. Um, Lahiri Mahasaya and Dipama were the first ones who actually bought, said that you can actually learn to be spiritual and be, and be in a renounced path while living in a business world. Lahiri Mahasaya used to initiate people into the Kriya Yogi movement who are in business, who are housewives, who are family members, but who are sincere and who still had earthly distractions but were willing to do the work and pay the price. And Dipama was the same. She taught, you know, mothers with children to, you know, while she was feeding their baby to be mindful while you're doing your Pilates class. So, yeah, there's been many, many great spiritual teachers and masters who were sent to help humanity through this time. I personally resonate strongly with Christ. I grew up in a strong Christian there. But over the years, I studied all the major spiritual movements and learned much from them. So the, overcoming the beast, overcoming the image, the fictions, illusions, deceptions, the graven images we serve. In other words, the things like where we attach ourselves to our sport. In fact, Christ, Krishna, Buddha also said, even if you attach yourself to your family over your path, you are still living in that illusion and you're trapped in that belief system and you're still going to be caught. And one of the things that's going to break many people to take the jab is that they, they want to see their family or they want to see their aunt in China or so their aunt in England or whatever else. So the other, so this, if you're saying this looks really hard, it's really hard. It's saying that to overcome what's coming and to be into what's called get through this and become empowered, you've got to overcome that lower mind, that lower frequency. You have to overcome the fictions, illusions, deceptions of the system, see what's real and what's not let go of your attachments, including family and everything, anything that's in your way. Um, the name of the beast, which is the vibrational coding in ancient culture, names were always associated with um, vibrations or frequencies or whatever else, like your coding. That's why they're camping with frequency and what's going on. And the number of his name, which is really what I call the biggest problem in the Western world about almost anything else is our absolute attachment to money and net worth. Like, most of you are defined by your jobs, your careers, your net worth, who's got the best house, do you have a house, what's your job, what's your this, um, what's your money like, you know, do you have a nice car. End of day, as people are finding out, who gives a rat's ass? If you've got food, if you're, if you're well loved, if you're at peace, if you're in good health, that's all that matters. So it's just letting go of the things that actually don't matter one little bit. Christ said, and like I said, I'm probably about two minutes from finishing, rest assured, before I take questions. Christ said that the kingdom of heaven is within you. And I love that. I mean, so many say about the church, you know, like, it's go to this church, go to this religion. No, 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 no. Christ said it's in you. Christ reveals himself, as C.S. Lewis taught, in so many forms to so many people. He, re he could reveal himself through a Krishna, um, through the Son of God in the Bible, many different ways to a different people depending. So the kingdom of heaven is within you. And the fact is, Whenever moral law breaks down, we have to correct our imbalances. We have to correct the inferior. We have to, we have to put the, stop the rot. I, as I mentioned at the start, I'm more concerned about the spiritual state of our society than I am in any way about the government. The governments only reflect the world of people. If we woke up and restored our consciousness, redeemed our hearts, and cleared the ruin and decay, we'd kick these guys out in two seconds flat, and um, we'd just get on with things, and they'd probably go through their... Um, their consequences and we move on with things. The issue that we've got is the bulk of people want to still live their life. And as I say, and this is vicious, but I, I want to say it. Most people, I've heard people, I mean, most people want to go to Vegas and bang their favorite stripper, um, go to the brothel, go to the pub, um, go and eat their food at their favorite cafe. And that's all that they care about or visit Aunt Mary over in um, Spain. It's, that's just the reality. And I've actually heard people say this. Everything I'm saying is not just me being a smart ass. I have heard this said. So there has to be this awakening and getting our priorities 100% correct. 
and transcending duality, you know, moving beyond duality, that nonsense, you know. Duality basically means, and duality is both sides. Duality is like, for example, like you're angry and you worked up and equally that you're on the other side. I'm for the system or I'm against masks. No, I'm, you want to stay balanced out of the triangle. I'm not here to rescue all of you from this horrible persecuted government. government. And I'm not here to help you as the victim. You don't want to be the victim. You don't want to be the persecutor. And you don't want to be the rescuer. It's not my job to rescue you. That's why people say, I need your help, Warren. Well, no. If you pay me for, as a client for advice um, in the field I am, which is not law anymore, yeah, absolutely. But I'm not a rescuer. You know, I'm, I'm doing this because I love doing it. Uh, you want to be outside the triangle, outside duality. That's one of the deeper teachings of spirituality. Grace is better than that at me. She's like my business partner and former wife, and she's the one you've heard her voice, and we're doing this together. Um, yeah, we got divorced years ago, and we stayed really great friends, and we run things together and still co-parents. It's really cool because we both chosen to transcend the beliefs and illusions about marriage and relationships, whatever other crap that you've got. So transcending duality means... You don't, I don't see the government as evil. I really don't. I mean, I can see evil actions taking place, but the greatest evil is in the hearts of men and women right now. So I see that the shift happens inwardly to start having the strength to deal outwardly with what's going on around. Because effectively, we are limited by the mass consciousness by what we're doing. There's a great awakening in America, for example, because when this happened, when America got in the mess and literally everything got changed in the 1800s, the reason there's a Bible Belt is because people found their spiritual energy, they awakened and, and went through a great awakening and cleanup, a spiritual cleanup. That was one of the reasons why America for 77 years broke free from the Rothschilds from, 19, from 1836 to 1913. That was why America had Lincoln and people like that rise up. So frequency upgrades, I'm sure many of you know, I'm speaking to the converted here, um, things like that. And hang on, my computer's jammed. Oh, yeah, it's working again. So frequency upgrades, fire to Ching here. I love this second verse here. The sages manage the work of the attached actions, conduct the teachings of no words. In other words, it's your action energy. I don't go around being the big anti-masker, but yet I'm probably freer than just about almost anyone I know with that because I just, I know that I'm free in that area. I don't have to run around proving it. I don't have to go and do a huge big statement. If I'm asked to wear one by someone coming into their class and I respect them five minutes, I'll probably, I, I don't know. My Pilates instructor asked me for two minutes if I could wear it walking in so she didn't look bad from the outside. I said, yeah, absolutely. Didn't, didn't bother me in the slightest. You know, for two minutes, I wasn't giving up my sovereignty. I was doing that for her because of the law of love. But I said, as long as when I walk into the studio and walk upstairs, it comes off. She goes, absolutely. And, you know, that was, and at the time, the laws had, uh, had relaxed. She said, you know, because once you're upstairs in my studio, I've been told I'm allowed to take it off you for vigorous exercise. I said, great. So do nothing and it shall be done for you. It doesn't mean become passive, but letting go is so powerful, you know, so powerful. So, so, so powerful. Gosh, this computer's just jamming all the time. Sorry about this, everyone. Take off. And like I said, so Krishna, he, <clears throat> one of the things that Krishna said as a final comment before, was Krishna made this marvelous comment where he was asked by a king who was really disturbed by everything that was going on. The king did say to him, um, you know, I'm really fed up with everything that's going on, you know. Um, I just want to renounce it all. I don't want to be, you know, killing people going to war. I should have said, look, man, it's all okay. Don't worry. He said, it's God who's de decreed that this war happened and God has decreed that these people be killed and God has decreed that these people pass on because they are preventing the progress of true religion. He said, go out and do your duty as king. If you walk away, this war will continue and all that will happen is your people will suffer even more and someone else has to rise up to do the job. Do your job, king. Go forth and fight for the truth. And the king listened to him. So that's just another perspective that's kind of worth listening. Okay. And one of my mentors said, everything is energy and energy can be transformed. So before we take questions, um, just so you know for future, if anyone's interested in coming along to more stuff that we're doing, 
we run, like I said, a not-for-profit spiritual awakening and lawful rights um, teaching movement, um, City Awakening. And we call it that. It was a vision I had years ago. Once I worked out all this was going to happen back in the early 2000s, Grace and I had a dream to set up something that would awaken the city, help people find their rights and, 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 and not lose their power. So we set up City Awakening for that purpose. And um, we've been building it quietly in the background for years. It's a not-for-profit movement, I emphasize. This is not a selling thing that we do. People do give tithes and donations, and that's mainly not used for personal profit, just by choice, because I make plenty of money from other sources. It's used to do various things like help other spiritual teachers, help fund the work, and ideally is we'd have more money coming in, help fund other things or you know anything to do with helping people's rights. So this is the movement here. What we do is every Sunday, we have a meeting and look, it's not like a normal church where you turn up and hear some silly shit. It's really not. It's very energetic. It's, it's the kind of stuff you've been hearing today. At the moment, we're doing a teaching on higher financial laws for prosperity to move beyond financial vulnerability. We've run three classes. Like I said, they're free classes. In the first hour, Grace does what's called quantum collapse, where she helps people balance the energy and come out the triangle. And then I then teach on, um, like myself or Steve quite often teaches too, um, on these higher, on, on stuff. At the moment, we're doing higher financial laws. We've done things on all different topics. We'll be doing um, separate meetings during the week in the near future on this kind of stuff, seeing as there seems to be interest in it. It's really to build an awakened community, but starting from within. And this is what I call our contribution to the world. This is not meant to supplement anything else. There are people like, I'm going to be speaking tomorrow to a guy of a political party who's keen to talk to me. There's amazing people doing that. There's amazing lawyers like Gene and Beth Bat. This is our contribution to educate, run this awakened community, because I truly believe that you have to arrest the spiritual decay happening at the heart of our mankind. So if you're really interested in coming along to that, um, then what you would do, if you're interested, then the City Awakening and um, group and Facebook group, you just would join that, okay? Um, and as well, I'll just quickly show you, we do have a website, but it's kind of, these are major upgrade at the moment, major upgrade. We can get on our mailing list this way. Um, it just needs a major upgrade, I warn you. But yeah, this gives you a little bit of an idea what we're doing. It's a spiritual awakening. These are the three amigos, this Grace, that's me in the middle, and that's Steve, the guy you were hearing talk. So yeah, you know, we go through different stuff. It's just our little thing. Like I said, it's a not-for-profit movement. Um, it's really designed to awaken and empower people and help people find their spiritual freedom. So, oh, 777 participants, I say that. So I like those synchronicities. So it's basically, yeah, if you're interested, just kind of, you know, you can join the Facebook group or we'll click on that one. Um, so does this interest anyone out of interest? Just out of curiosity, is this the kind of thing that interests anyone at all? Like I said, that's the thing that really, it, this really grabs me and interests me immensely. Okay. On that note, um, questions. And like I said, keep in mind there's still a lot of people on here, so um, I'll probably have to get Steve to come on and help me and get any yeah. questions you can see. Yeah, for sure. I, I've had a lot of trouble with my computer. It's kept freezing for 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 some reason, and and so I've missed a lot of the questions. But Warren, there's been probably two main ones um, coming through in a theme, and the first one is. Um, doesn't I, I, let me rephrase it i guess to sum up the different angles for it but doesn't federal law and the constitution trump state laws in other words the federal biosecurity act says xyz which means the states therefore can't lock down and so it's that i guess it's that legal principle of doesn't yeah. federal law trump state law that's that's been coming through quite um quite a lot okay i'll answer that one then go next one Look, constitutional law is a, is a, is a, is a complicated one. Um, this has been a kind of battle for the last 120 years. When the original federation, there's Quick and Garin's annotated constitution, if you're ever kind of interested to know more, um, Quick and Garin, G-A-R-A-N, annotated constitution. 
the original purpose of federation was not to supplant the state rights, okay? So when they set up the Commonwealth, the states were very concerned about losing their rights and kind of being taken over by a power. So what was a, they were, the, the Commonwealth was actually given very limited powers. So people think that the Commonwealth is the power. No, 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 no. It was the opposite. The idea was that the states would by and large remain in control of their own state, but that the Commonwealth would actually be given certain powers and only what falls in section 51. So the Biosecurity Act is an interesting one because yes, it does, it does trump over state law with some things, but the health one's interesting because if you read section 51, there's, um, there's limits on their power with health and the states have got to do it. And that's why they've got the national cabinet right now. Because for example, states can manage their own response to the pandemic. That's not required the Commonwealth can't come in and tell them what to do. The, um, the, the interrelation between the Biosecurity Act and the state legislation, well, the Biosecurity Act lets them do that kind of stuff, but does give certain rights and freedoms and limitations. I mean, the states have gone, and some of them have gone a little bit outside of it. Have they um, overstepped their rights? I don't know. Nathan Buckley might know that better than me. Um, if I looked into it in great detail, and did a 10 hour legal research, I probably would work it out eventually. But for my, my initial, I used to be very good on constitutional law. I'm, I'm less up to date with it as I used to be. But what I can tell you is that um, they don't have, the Commonwealth don't have unlimited power to override the states. That, that, that I can tell you right now, categorically. They, they only have certain powers they can do. And generally they're very careful to stay within that because they know that if they're too black and white, so my guess is that it's probably a grey area in that the, the, like, for example, there's certain things they can't do, like medical conscription, various things like that, like a, med like a forced medical pharmaceutical. They can't set up a national religion, for example. There's things like that. So, yeah, my guess is that probably from what I've worked out and my initial limited research on it, it seems to be that the Biosecurity Act does definitely put some limits on them. And technically, for example, you don't have to disclose your um, your privacy and things like that. But yeah, certainly the state's response to the pandemic, as the High Court case with Clive Palmer shows, they, they got every right to do it. And the Commonwealth have only got certain limits. So that's my response to that. But yeah, it's I think that's one thing that's definitely, definitely we can certainly say is, is the case, is that, yeah, the Biosecurity Act, the state's, if there's a conflict between that and the state one, the Commonwealth one would probably prevail, provided that it doesn't overstep, overreach its 51 powers, so to speak, which gives the states pretty much the power to manage their own pandemics and their own health situation. So and if you say that's vague, unfortunately, they deliberately make it so vague that there's lots of room. And the original intention, if you read Crick and Garin of the Constitution, has been watered down so badly in the high court, you know, and bit by bit, um, the Commonwealth have been given more power and the states have been given less in some and other areas, the states have been given more and the Commonwealth less because it's so much open to interpretation. Yeah, okay, thanks, Warren. Um, just a couple of things here, a couple of questions about City Awakening. Is City Awakening face-to-face -face or online? It's actually online like this on a Sunday morning and City Awakening, um, does that give financial and law advice? No, that is a spiritual group. Warren has other companies that deal with the financial and, and legal advice. Um, and probably the other big one, Warren, that's coming through is about QR codes and where do we stand with checking in, sure. um, both as a, I guess, as a consumer and as an employee. Um, there seems to be a lot of questions around that. Sure. Um, just to clarify, yes, yeah, Steve is correct. Spirit, Spirit, City Awakening is a not-for-profit spiritual um, group. Um, it, it doesn't give legal advice or any kind of financial advice that it's licensed to. Um, I don't give any legal advice from not a licensed lawyer. I do have a company called, um, let me just get it up for you. Um, there is, depending what you're wanting, if you're wanting financial education, the Global Wealth Club, that's a, that's a business which is a, a business where we run education and people pay and actually get educated to get through the great reset. So that's where we cover the financial side. Um, we also have a tax planning business, which is a separate company as well. So yeah, the home, the City Awakening um, is a not-for-profit group. In terms of the QR code, yeah, look, that's a really good question there. You've just got to go back to the foundation. The issue is on the state of blooming emergency, 
this horrendous scammy kind of thing that's going on with that one. Yeah, if you actually understand martial law, they can do whatever measures are reasonable to basically um, do this thing. So the states have been under persistent states of emergency since March, and many have pointed out that, say, in Queensland, for example, where they've got different provisions to West Australia, it's absurd. Like, literally, just as they're coming up to the expiry, they suddenly have a breakout, you know? Whether that means it's, um, <laughs> it's all made up or not, um, it's just strangely coincidental. So if while the state of emergency is in place, well, I don't really see the basis of, of um, you know, it's morally um, outrageous, it's lawfully, but technically, if there's a state of emergency, if there's a virus thing, and if they're trying to track down for the, for the things of the virus, then it's, it's valid. So until this state of emergency gets stopped, um, so how do I handle that myself? Well, I mean, if I'm asked to sign in by a business because it's their business and it's a bit like if I come to your house and you ask me to take my shoes off when I enter your house, I won't just sit there and argue my wife to wear shoes. I'll take my shoes off or I'll say I don't want to take my shoes off and leave your house. So that's my approach when I go to a business. You know, if they don't ask me, I don't bother. I just walk in and do it. If they ask me, I said, yeah, no problem. I prefer to write out my name on the register. I don't really like using my phone and I try to avoid the EMF um, radiation anyway. So most of the time my phone's actually on flight mode unless I'm actually using it because when I went to my kinesiologist some weeks ago, it showed up that I'd got so much EMFs in my system. I was actually starting, it was affecting my immune system. So I thought, yikes, I better get that fixed up. So yeah, my look, we, the main thing that's got to be knocked out is the state of emergency. And that's going to be a legal thing. But deeper than that, to get the consciousness of the people strong enough, there has to be a spiritual awakening and an inner empowering that starts first and a change of thinking. One thing I'll just have to say, you cannot understand how absolutely powerful um, this actually is. I'll show you something. I worked with this guy in America and we've seen extraordinary stuff and I won't go into this, but we have the number of times when things have started to get bad in our city, we have done work energetically doing the stuff this guy taught and seen next day that policies get changed. It's there's so many coincidences. So we know, I know the power of spiritual shifts to actually change things. I've been, I literally got healed from an impossible illness years ago, but I would never be done by changing um, that kind of stuff. You know, I, um, by doing that kind of stuff. And yeah, someone said about boycotting businesses, look, this way, you just don't go. Because I personally think that airlines are going to get the shock of their life um, at some, when a lot of people don't travel anymore. And they're going to be forced to accept, um, you know, people who haven't been jabbed the best thing people would do is just not give their woman business to them like um i went to a pharmacy who was really annoying with me so, and i've gone to him for a while so yeah i won't use them except as an absolute last resort i'll go to other ones now um the best the best thing you can do is just don't give people your custom who are you know who are over the top and in terms of um you know people who are and like I said, my approach is always to come back to this. Whether you like it or not, right now there is a state of emergency in place. And until that foundation gets legally knocked out, I don't go against it. I don't. I learn to be smart within the state of emergency. But yeah, I mean, you know, if I'm asked to fill out the form, um, yeah, you know, if I'm asked to fill out, I'll fill it out. If a business asks me, if I, and things like that. I don't like the QR contact tracing or whatever else because that thing I can see is inevitable move towards a microchipping or whatever else. So someone says that the way to prove there is an emergency, look, I think, that, I, I think there is, but like I said, it's, it's not a simple task because number one, the lawyer's got to take it to the court, they've got to produce the evidence and the court will eventually have to rule that the whole thing is a scam for a state of emergency, which pretty much... The, the, the high court would have to say that the whole thing is a scam from all the governments worldwide. Now that's going to take some balls. It won't happen. Not without a huge people push in the same way that the Star Chamber got overcome in 1665. The same thing happened in the 1660s with the Star Chamber that were doing the same kind of nonsense. And it changed because there were some brave jurors who stood up and refused to bow, were locked in jail 
for days, but the people got so mad about it, they stood up and demanded on the streets in mass, and then people got up and said no more. And the government's hastily changed the laws, and 23 years later, the Bill of Rights came in. So, you know, things, things like that can happen. But it's going to take a cultural change. I mean, can, you, can anyone here in their right mind, being logical, honestly imagine the High Court getting up and saying all the states of emergency is a scam because the pandemic is a scam? It's just not going to happen. Not, not, not in the near future. It's going to take a big change in people. So you've got to find your part in this. If you feel called to push back hard and go and protest and that's what you know is your path, yeah, some, some will be called to do that. Some will be called to, um, you know, go to court and help with a class action. Various ones will have different parts in the army of God. That's how I see it. Just got to know your part. Any other questions that you've noticed, um, Steve? Um. Oh no! There's just getting. We're just getting more about QR codes and doesn't the um, George, for, in, for instance, ask the Privacy Act Amendment Act of 2020 states that QR code sign is unlawful. Organisations enforcing that as liable for a 5k fine or five years. I think that's probably right. My 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 observation of that is that is probably right. Now that is like I said, I emphasized. I would look. I like to to to, to be realistic and not make up shit. I don't know. From what I've looked into it, it looks like that. I know Serena Tafa, Tahafa and the human rights advocates have been getting big success in ringing up businesses and advocate them. From my initial looking into it and having a read of it, I think that's probably correct. Would I give a legal opinion? No, because I'm not a lawyer anymore, so I couldn't do one if I wanted to. Um, and secondly, yeah, I would. I'm, yeah, I mean, I would. I would be listening to someone like Nathan Buckley of GNB Lawyers or Serena. Or someone who can go through the legal provisions, map them out and show all that and how that all works. But yeah, my feeling is it is a breach of the privacy. Um, I, I, that's my feeling. But in saying that, like I said, what makes it complicated is the states do have the right to manage the pandemic with a reasonable response. Like the Clive Palmer case shows, well, if it goes to court and the conflict is, is the state, is the state allowed to manage the pandemic by doing this? And what takes priority, the Commonwealth Privacy Act or this kind of stuff, well, the states have reassured it will only be used for contact tracing. And I know one of the things in WA, the police were misusing it to actually go and find witnesses. So I know Mark McGowan, I mean, he's been hasty to quickly get in there and they're passing laws to make sure the police can't do that. My guess is they probably got advice from a constitutional lawyer because my feeling is that if it goes to the High Court, the High Court would hold but although the Privacy Act works, provided it's maintained for contact tracing only for the purposes of the virus and nothing else, it would be it would be reasonable proportion based on the Clive Palmer case. Am I right? I don't know. Um, would Nathan Buckley have a different opinion? Possibly. That's how I've looked at it and I've read all this stuff through and worked out to the best of my ability. So, yeah, I think it's a grey area. I think that... Um, it is a breach of privacy. Um, my concern is that they have not proven so far they will manage the privacy aspects of it at all, which I haven't. Like they, like I said, the cops were using it for the witnesses. It's been happening in every single state. And that would be, and that's, and my opinion on that one is if that went to court, um, that might, that's one the high court might hold in favor, but someone's got to take it to the high court. It's got to go through the process. And so far, the High Court haven't been particularly favourable to any actions against the government. The, someone took an action on the Victorian lockdown um, and lost. And that's just because, yeah, so there's got to be a shift in, like I said, I, I, I cannot emphasise it enough, shift in consciousness, shift in thinking, shift in everything. Um, Warren, we've had a, just a couple also asking you about the upcoming census. Is that a breach of privacy? Should they do the census, not do the census? Any response? Oh, to I don't that? like census one little bit. Um, <laughs> I, I know you don't. But... <laughs> oh. I haven't done one for years. Um, yeah. But yeah, look, um, <laughs> there's a lot of things. <laughs> um, but no, I've done things. I, I always do things within the law. I find out my position and things like that. So um, I might just get you to stop the recording now, just right. so, like I said, I can talk a bit more freely if I feel like anything.
enough people, you know, if enough people do that, um, then there's a small chance. So that's why I recommend to start going deeper into yourself to get some answers um, for what you're looking